How do I say this? Okay, I just gotta say it. I gotta get it off my chest. Don't get mad. The Tales of the Texas Rangers is not a Western. It's a crime drama. <sighs> Truth is hard sometimes. Welcome back, Hearth and Homies. As you might have guessed, tonight's compilation is Tales of the Texas Rangers. This police procedural aired on NBC Radio from 1950 to 1952. Joe McRae starred as Texas Ranger Jace Pearson. The show always showcased the latest scientific methods used in criminal investigation. This show was from the same vein as Crime Does Not Pay, Dragnet, Whitehall 1212, The Black Museum, and other shows that would reenact real criminal cases. The show was produced and directed by Stacy Keach Sr., the father of TV's Mike Hammer, Stacy Keach Jr. It also used a retired Texas Ranger, Captain Manuel T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, who retired from a 30-year career. This is really one of my favorite crime shows. And honestly, when I first discovered it, I thought it was a Western, and I was really into Westerns at the time, and I listened to a couple episodes, and I was like, ah, this isn't a Western. And then it was, I don't know, it was like a suddenly dawned on me, wait, this isn't a Western, it's a really good crime drama, and it's become one of my favorites ever since. So sit back and relax, enjoy that virtual fireplace, some beautiful scenery, and join us for Tales of the Texas Rangers. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joe McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Deadhead Freight. shortly before midnight, August 27, 1938, at the Santa Fe Freight Yards in Lubbock, Texas. A deadhead freight hauling empties back to the west coast from Galveston has just pulled into the yard. The brakeman and a railroad detective are making a routine check of the cars for free-riding hobos. If I was a yard dick, I'd be snoozing in the roundhouse. You ain't found a free-rider in months. Yeah, so what? I get paid to check and I check. Oh, you know, bows on the freights always hop off before we pull into the yards. You ever think one of them might fall asleep in a car and not have anybody to wake him up? Well, could be. Yeah, flashy light missing. Okay. Hey, see? Nobody. Mm. Now, the car up ahead is the last of the boxcars. I walked the flats and gondolas while we was rolling, so I know that they're clear. Hey, hey, why is the door rolled shut on this one? Well, I don't know now. Shouldn't be. Now let's get her open. And throw your light around. Yeah. Mm. Nobody riding, huh? <laughs> Come on. All right, Bo. On your feet. And throw that light right on him. Yeah. Well, no wonder it didn't move just an old duffel bag. Yeah. Uh, what's a duffel bag doing on a deadhead freight? Ain't there something in it, huh? Hey, hey, come here. Feel this. All right. Feels like a body. Hey, you got a knife on you? Yeah, here. That's a good thing we didn't pass this car. The top of the bag sewed up tight. I have to cut right through the side. Yeah. What? It's a young woman. Yeah. Stabbed to death. And throw that light around the car. Well, what are you looking for? 
There's no blood any place. She wasn't killed on the train. Somebody must have loaded the body on to get rid of it. Yeah, so the murder can't be pinned down in any definite area. It, where'd you stop last, before you pulled in here? A side and west of Sweetwater? The body must have been put on someplace between there and Galveston, then. We better call the police. Eh? They can notify the Texas Rangers. <laughs> After a brief but penetrating study of the situation, Ranger Captain Stinson had the body removed to a Lubbock funeral parlor. He then requested Texas Ranger Jace Pearson to take over the case. Well, there it is, Jace. Pretty brutal job of stabbing. You figure it happened a good piece from here, huh? Couple of reasons for that. Here's a map. Shows the route the freight train took. Spot circled in red shows where it made stops. And at what time. I see. No stops after it left the siding outside Sweetwater, huh? Right. And most of the stops were made much further east. Hmm. Well, according to the time of these stops, body must have been loaded on the train between Presby here and Turner City here. Well, how do you arrive at that? Train made all its night stops between these points. Isn't likely the killer loaded the body on by daylight. Too much chance of being spotted by the train crew. Well, that's good reasoning, Jace. You may be right. You said the body was sewed up in a duffel bag. Yeah, you better look at it before I send it on to the lab. Mm. I have the undertaker lock it in this cabinet and give me the key. Yeah, here it is. Regular opening at the top of the bag is sewed up tight. The draw cord is missing. See? Uh-huh. Good thing the man who found the body cut into the bag instead of ripping out those new stitches. Yeah, I see what you mean. Kind of funny stitching. It may have been made by somebody with a special trade where that kind of stitching's used. Lab gets a look at it, may be able to tell us what trade. Well, I hope so. The bag itself won't help much, I'm afraid. Uh, probably picked up in war surplus. Could belong to anybody. Hey, look at this, the bottom of the bag. It's kind of soiled. Whoever carted it around with a body in it must have set it on the ground to rest. He sure did, on reddish brown earth. Blood seepage made some of it stick. Let's have a look at that train map again. I think that earth stain kind of narrows down our search, Captain. Oh? How come? I know the country that train passed at night. I've been over it plenty. Only place I've seen earth that color is right around this area in a few stream beds. Cotton Belt runs parallel to the railroad for about 40 miles through there. Well, I've seen all I want to see, unless you have something else. Nope. Let's go. I'll get this bag off to Austin. Body going to be held here for identification? Yeah, if she isn't identified, we'll see if we can run down something by her clothes. Any laundry marks or anything on them? Afraid not, Jace. Homemade and home laundered. No dental work to help us either. And her fingerprints out on the file. Might have a man check on the shoes she was wearing. They weren't homemade. Yeah, we'll try it. You got any ideas about what you're going to do? If it's all right with you, I'd like to take a crack at that cotton belt area. Tow charcoal down on the horse trailer and then ride parallel to the railroad tracks and see what I can find. Well, it's a lot of territory. How about Steve Clark riding with you? Good deal. We get anything from the lab, I'll let you know. I'll radio Clark and assign him. Then you can pick him up on the way. Good luck, Jace. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. I met Clark. We drove down to the beginning of the area I wanted to check, left the car, and used our horses for the long ride along the rail bed. By noon of the next day, we'd covered 15 miles. Horses are getting tired, Jase. I know. There's a siding a little ways ahead. Freight stopped there. Yeah. Look, another covered coming up. Yeah. Uh, bank's pretty steep. Watch your horse. All right. Careful, boy. Easy, charcoal. Careful. Easy. Steep climb out of here, Jase. Maybe if we ride... Hey, what are you looking at? Oh, the ground, huh? Yeah. Same reddish-brown color we've been checking for. Well, don't see anything else, though. Want to ride through it a ways? Yeah. Come on, Chuck. Oh, boy. I don't want to be a killjoy, Jase, but we've done this in a dozen creek beds. Yeah, but none of the others were as close to a train stop. Siding's only about 50 yards further up the... Ooh, ooh, Charcoal. Oh, boy. Ooh. Find something, Jase? Yeah. Come here. What is it? Yeah, marks in the sand. Trace of a couple of footprints, not enough to make a cast. But look at this other mark. A round impression. Yeah, what made it? 
Might have been somebody setting that duffel bag down. Yeah? Well, that would account for the dirt you found on the bag. We'll find out. Get a glass jar from your saddle pack. Okay. You? Gonna cut a core around that mark? Yeah. Lab contested for blood trace. Earth this color, we can't tell anything by sight. Well, here's the jar. Thanks. A few empty cans around here, Jace. Those marks might have been made by a hobo. No, I don't think so. Bindle stiffs travel light. They don't carry duffel bags. And what's the nearest town to here? Uh, Bullville, about a mile further on. Well, let's get there. We can phone for a highway patrol car, and they can drive you back and pick up our car. All right. You going to check around Bullville? With a fine-tooth comb. The cotton crop around Bullville was good. Too good. Migratory pickers were jamming the town. I had photos of the dead girl and tried to find somebody who might have seen her. No, no, Ranger. Never saw her around the gin here. Town's full up, though. It's possible one of the pickers saw her someplace. You know anybody who comes in contact with a lot of the pickers? No, no. Afraid you have to tackle them crew by crew. That's what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Must be a couple of thousand migratories around. You mind if I ask your man at the weighing platform to check with the haulers when they bring cotton in for ginning? No, it's all right with me. Thanks. Oh, uh, uh, Ranger, yeah. hold it a second. Uh, just happened to think. There is somebody who gets to see a lot of the pickers. Who? The Mexican woman. Name's old Rosie. Drives a junky old truck around peddling soda pop in the fields. You know where I can locate her? Yeah, haulers give you lift out to the fields. And somebody will steer you out to her. <laughs> Everybody knows old Rosie. Hey. Somebody killed that poor girl, huh? That's right, Rosie. You ever see her? You find who killed her, you're going to put him in a jail? That's my job. How about it? You ever seen her around here? She, one time. Where? At the bus station in the town. She was with a man. You know who the man was? No, senor. Now, why'd you hesitate? Is that the truth? Why should I tell a lie, senor? I don't know who the man was. But he she described the man, a vague, stumbling description that might fit anybody. And while she described him, I had a feeling she was lying. A feeling that was strengthened by a faint odor of whiskey coming from the truck. Whatever business Rosie was in, it wasn't limited to the sale of soft drinks. I pretended to swallow her story, then I got a lift back to town where Steve Clark was waiting with our car. Better hop in, Jase. Just had a call from Austin. Yeah, they checked the earth sample sent in in a jar. Yeah, blood trace all right. Same type as the victims. They got a line on a few other things, too. The shoes on the dead girl have been traced through the manufacturer to a store in Sheffield. Yeah, I wrote down the name of the store and the address. Better get over there and see if we can establish identity. Yeah, shoes will be waiting at the Sheffield airport. It isn't likely that a shoe clerk is going to remember who he sold them to, though. I saw the shoes. They've been repaired recently. Whoever fixed them might remember. Well, that's a chance. Any information on that duffel bag? Uh, yeah, a lab ties it in with a seaman. How? Well, stitches used to sew up the bag are the kind seaman used to mend a torn sail. Hmm. Chase, you look like that throws you. It does, a little. I was beginning to have a sneaking suspicion about an old Mexican woman. But she's no seaman. <laughs> well, what made you suspect her? She said she saw the dead girl with a man. She gave me kind of a phony description. Not only that, but she's supposed to be selling soft drinks to the field hands from an old truck. It reeked of liquor. Oh, bootlegging, huh? Hey, that could mean something. What? A report from Austin mentioned liquor stains on that duffel bag. Naturally, they just figured that a bottle had been broken in the bag at one time or another, but... Yeah, but it could be something else, too. Yeah? That bag might have been used for hauling moonshine. Stop the car. Hey, Jace, what's the matter? Slide out. I'm going to Sheffield alone. You stay here. Okay, Jace. What do you want me to work on? Tail old Rosie, the Mexican woman, while I'm gone. Check on any special contacts she makes. Whoever she sees, find out who they are. See if you can run down any who've worked as seamen. <laughs> I burned up the road to Sheffield. The clerk who'd sold the shoes couldn't help, but I got the information I was after in a repair shop. My show, show, I fix it is, all right? Look, here's where I sold the broken strap, you see? Uh, I remember because of something else, though I never get a pay for the job. Whose shoes are they? Mrs. Watson. She's a lady two blocks up at Brownwood House. Mrs. Watson, huh? Is her husband around? Oh, no, no, no. It's a go away a month ago. That's why she got no money for pay for the shoes. 
I know you bother her. She lived with her mother and her little baby. She's a one-year-old. Any idea where her husband went? Oh, no. Sometimes she says to go away for work or someplace with the cotton. Sometimes to Galveston to work for the boats. Oh, he's been a sailor, huh? Sailor, everything. Whatever he is, he's no send the money. Last week, she come in. She says she's going to meet him and she's going to pay me when she's come back. But she's not come back. Hey, just a minute. Why are you asking me all this thing, eh? And how come you got the shows? Because Mrs. Watson doesn't need him anymore. She's dead. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Deadhead Freight, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It wasn't the kind of news you enjoy breaking to a dead girl's mother. And the girl's baby crying in the next room didn't help it any. You see, they, they'd split up about a month ago. And then last week, her husband wrote to her from Bowville. He said he was sorry and he wanted my daughter Helen to come to me. I thought she was there with him. Looks like she was for a while. Oh, he promised Helen everything in the letter. Said he had a lot of money for her and their baby. <laughs> he was never any good. And now the baby's left to me and I'm just too old. I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> Can you give me your son-in-law's full name and his description? Herbert Watson is his name. They call him Bud. Herbert Bud Watson. <laughs> About how tall would you say he was? <laughs> hey, you better pull yourself together, ma'am. Somebody's at the door. I, I'll call out the wind and send him away. I, I don't want to see anybody now. <laughs> What is it, ma'am? What's the matter? Come on, somebody! Open the door! It's him. My son-in-law, Bud. All right, ma'am. Open the door and let him in. Go ahead. Well, what took you so long? Where's Helen? You know where she is. What did you do to her? What did you do to my girl? Are you crazy? What's the matter? Let him go, ma'am, and stand back. What? Ranger, what? Get your hands up and turn around. You killed her. And you got the gall to come here with your own baby cry. Ranger, what is this? Kill who? <laughs> Helen. Where's Helen? Where is she? Don't you know, Watson? Or did you think she'd never be identified? Helen's been murdered? Oh, no. No. You did it. You no, did no, it. No, no, Mom. No, I, I gave her money. <laughs> Told her to come back home and I'd meet her here today. <laughs> Who's going to take the kid and... Make a fresh start. How much money did you give your wife? A thousand dollars. That's a lot. Where'd you get it? Come on. I, I, I was bootlegging to the pickers. How long you been getting away with that? Started it last season. Did old Rosie sell any of this stuff for you? How did you know about that? I didn't for sure until now. Come on. We're going back to your place of business in Bowlville. Hi, Jace. Steve. Yeah, I got your message to meet you here. Rosie's over there. Want to get her off the truck? Yeah, she can talk from there. Come on. You too, Watson. Okay. Bud Watson, murdered girl's husband. And bootleg him here. Rosie's been moving some of the stuff for him. Oh? Well. Why you keep me from my work, senor? Your work isn't as legal as it could be, Rosie, so sit tight. Uh, yeah, you ever seen this man before? You know she's seen me before. They didn't ask you. How about it, Rosie? Si. All right, Rosie. Now, is he the same man you saw at the bus depot with the girl whose picture I showed you? Si. He's the man. At the bus depot? But that ain't so. I was never with Helen at the bus depot. You didn't meet her when she came down here? No, I tell you. I didn't know what bus she was coming in on. Or even if she would come after she got my letter. First I saw her, she turned up here at the shack. Well, how about when she left to go home? Uh, she only stayed two, three hours, all told. Let her go back to the bus depot alone because, well, it was getting dark. Near time for the pickers to be coming there to buy drinks. You hear that, Rosie? Yeah. That means one of you is lying. 
Rosie tell the truth, senor? Uh, you don't always tell the truth, Rosie. The first time I asked you about the man you saw, you said he was a stranger, but, a man you'd never seen before. I forget, senor. Mm. I see a lot of people every day in the fields. I, yeah, I, you trying to kid me? You've been selling liquor for this man. You couldn't mistake him for a stranger. But I do, senor. I make mistake. You wanted help, I give you help. Rosie tell you all she knows, that's all. <laughs> Now it was obvious that Rosie was lying, just as I'd suspected her of lying the first time. There had to be a reason for it. We took Bud Watson into Bowlville jail, then went back to search his shack. I can't figure something, Jace. Why won't Watson admit it if he was at the bus station with his wife? That wouldn't hurt him. No, it wouldn't. That's why I think he's telling the truth. You know, Rosie must be covering up for something. Covering up for somebody's a better guess. She might have done it herself. No, I don't think so. She's too old to cart a body across the country to the railroad. Well, then you figure she really did see Mrs. Watson at the bus depot with a man, huh? Yeah. The man who killed her to get the thousand dollars Bud Watson had given her. Well, then what's Rosie's angle and lying to us? Oh, that's an easy one, Steve. Shakedown. Hey, Chase, you're right. Couldn't be anything else. Why, it'd be worth the cut for her to forget seeing the man and say it was Watson instead. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Well, I watched her while you were gone. She didn't make any suspicious contacts, nothing that could have been a payoff. She might have gotten her payoff right after I showed her the Watson girl's picture and told her she'd been murdered. That was before you started a tailor. Yeah, I didn't think of that. She had time. Well, we combed this shack, Jace. Nothing here. What do we do now? Go back to Taylor and Rosie again. If she squeezed hush money out of the man once, she's liable to try it again. They all do. We'll start by watching her house when she comes in from the fields tonight. We staked out near Rosie's adobe hut, but it got dark and she didn't come in from the fields. I left Steve on watch and went out to look for her, keeping an eye out for her old truck. I found it about five miles out, surrounded by a group of men carrying torches. Hey, what's going on here? Uh, oh, Ranger! Uh, oh, Rosie! You better come! Yeah, what happened? Uh, we was walking into town. We saw the truck here by the side of the road, thought maybe it broke down, so we started to call for old Rosie. Then one of the boys spotted the blood on the ground. What blood? I'll show you over here. Must be old Rosie's, I reckon, because we found her over here in the cotton row. She's dead, Ranger. Somebody cut her throat from ear to ear. <laughs> Old Rosie had tried to shake down a killer once too often with the usual payoff. I sent a rush call to Steve Clark to tow his horse out and join me. We followed the trail which led to a deserted picker shack way off in a field that looked like it hadn't been cultivated for years. The shack had been occupied, though, recently occupied. But whoever had been there was gone. There's a lamp there, Steve. Light it. Yeah. Clean as a whistle, Jay. Yeah, it's too clean. That floor's been scrubbed mighty hard for a shack like this. It sure has. Especially for a place nobody's living in. Must have been cleaning up blood. Yeah. And there are two other things. What's that? Whoever was hiding here was mighty handy with a knife. Look at the inside of the door. Circle drawn on the wood. Wood chipped where somebody practiced throwing a knife at it. Yeah, good aim. All the marks are right smack inside the circle. Now, what else? Take a look at the lamp you just lit. The cord it's hanging by. Uh, it's just an ordinary hunk of rope. Except for the knot holding the lamp, a running bowlin. So the light could be raised or lowered toward the table. A running bowlin is a seaman's knot. Yeah, and that cord is just about big enough to be the draw cord from a duffel bag. Our seaman was here, all right. Well, it couldn't have been Watson, Jace. He was safe in jail when Rosie was killed. Yeah. Whoever Rosie saw with Mrs. Watson at the bus depot must have met the girl after she left Watson. After she had the money. Yeah. Married woman on her way home to her baby isn't liable to leave a bus depot with a stranger, is she? Chances are it was somebody she knew. Well, Watson's been a sailor. Think it might have been an old shipmate of his? Let's go see if he remembers one who was handy with a knife. You say somebody killed old Rosie? Yeah. The same man who killed your wife. Now think and think hard. Yeah. The killer was a seaman. We got reason to think it could be an old shipmate of yours who knew your wife. Oh, but Helen knew shipmates of mine all along the Gulf. 
I introduced her to lots of them. The one we want had a habit of throwing a knife. Hey, he drew targets on a door. Never missed. <sighs> Matt Corbett. It was Matt Corbett! How do you know? Any reason for him to be around here? Yeah. He was my partner last year. Bootlegging here. Business got bad and he left. I wrote to him months ago asking him to come back for this picking, but he never answered me. Did Rosie know him? Sure she did. From last year. That's it, Clark. Rosie'd seen Corbett with Mrs. Watson. That's why he couldn't run with the money after he'd killed her. He had to wait to see if the body was found and identified. And when we moved in and she knew about the murder, she really had him pinned down. And he right. used to be my best friend. A sneak. Well, never mind that now. Where would he run to? I don't know. He was always Roman, like me. Hey, you wrote to him someplace, you said. You must have an address. Yeah. Yeah, it was a general delivery at Port O'Connor. There's no bait shack there. He lived in it whenever he had enough money to stop moving for a while. He's got enough now. What he got from your wife. Come on, Clark. Let's get him. We headed for Port O'Connor. Made it by morning and found the abandoned bait shack. Nobody inside, Jase, can see through the window. He isn't here. Yeah, he's probably traveling by freight to avoid being spotted. He couldn't have beaten us here. We rolled too fast. Gonna stake it out and wait? Yeah, our car's out of sight where we left it. He won't spot it coming along the wharf. Come on, let's go inside. Yeah, it looks like Matt Corbett's the man we're after, all right. Same trademarks here we found on that picky shack at Bullville. Yeah, knife marks in a circle on the door. Same running bull and holding the lamp. Draw that burlap sack across the window. That'll make it pretty dark in here, Jase. You want it dark when you're throwing a surprise party. Hey, Steve. Steve, wake up. Huh? What? Shh. Somebody coming along the wharf. It's dark. What time is it? A little after midnight. Steps are coming closer. Yeah, it must be Corbett. Nothing to bring anybody else this way at this time of night. He's heading for here, all right. Yeah. Let him get all the way inside. And remember, he's got that knife and he's handy with it. I know. All right, Corbett. Here. Never mind that lamp. What's the name, Steve? Yeah. Get that the light, Steve. Can you handle him? Stop your struggling, Corbett. You stop stinking. My arm. Ah. You broke my arm. All right. Just wrench your shoulder, Corbett. <sighs> Keep you from throwing that knife for a while. Come on, get up. Better light the lamp now, Steve. It's a good thing you jumped him, Jace. I felt that knife pass in my ear. Look, buried in that wall a good inch. Hey. Rangers. I thought you were a couple of crooks. Hey, what's you doing here? Just dropped in to arrest you for the murder of Helen Watson and old Rosie up at Bullville. It'd be nice if you could prove it. I haven't been near Bullville. I think we can prove you were. By marks you left on the door and a few other things. How'd you come back, Freight? Are you kidding? No, I'm serious. You should have rode Pullman. Get your shoes shined on a Pullman. Would have taken that reddish-brown earth off your shoes. Our lab can match that with Bullville. Watch out for that shoulder. Yeah, that's better, Corbett. Want to cuff him, Jace? No. I think he'll come quiet. All right, Corbett. Let's move. Herbert Bud Watson served the required term for his bootlegging activities, and Matt Corbett was tried and convicted of murder. The sentence of the court was carried out on February 20th, 1939, when at Huntsville Penitentiary, Matt Corbett died in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. In the early days of Texas, major disturbances were not infrequent. It was a lusty, brawling, growing territory, and as happens in such a territory, there were days when the streets were not safe for the good citizens. An Easterner, happening into a Texas town at such a time, found shelter in the house of a minister. Everything will be all right soon, he was assured. 
Later that same afternoon, the minister, who'd been looking out the window, said, Well, friend, the streets are safe now. You may go about your business. The Easterner looked out the window, but all he saw was a lone figure riding casually down the main street on a horse. What makes you think it's safe for me out there now, he asked in bewilderment. The minister pointed to the horseman. Because that feller on the horse is a Texas Ranger, he said. Only folks that aren't safe in this town now are the ones who started the trouble. And when he finds them, they'll wish they'd been peaceable. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production, Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Herb Ellis, Tom Holland, Byron Kane, Tom McKee, and Lillian Byer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death in the cards. It is 11.30 p.m. on the night of January 26, 1947, at the ranch house of Chester Gentry in Reeves County, Texas. Chester is on the telephone as his stepson, Will, enters. No sign of him, huh? All right. Call me when you find him. Thanks, Sheriff. Where you been, Will? Just out having a beer. That Sheriff Bennett you were talking to? Yeah. Your friend Tovich telephoned you a while ago. Tovich? Oh, you didn't tell the Sheriff about Tovich. I sure did. Sheriff just called to say he located Tobich's rooming house over in Biggestown, but Tobich wouldn't there. But I've told you a hundred times it's the worst thing in the world you could do. Tobich finds out to kill me. Will, I... Maybe he has found out you told the sheriff. Maybe he's on his way here right now to get me. Look, you've got to give me the money to pay him off now. No, Will. No more money. Do you know what you're saying? He'll kill me if I don't pay him. He told me so. Now you listen to me, Will. I've reached the end of my rope in this whole rotten mess. I'm through. I'm not going to get another dime from you. I've done everything I can for you, but... You're just no good. Please, Dad, I need that donut. You shut up and listen to me. When your ma died, I promised her I'd do everything I could for you. And I have. I treated you like you was my own son. I've given you a home. I've given you money. A lot of money. And what have you done with it? You've thrown it away to a slimy gambler named Tobich. But, Dad... For two months it's been going on. For two months you've been bleeding me white to pay off that gambler. I told you to stay away from him, but you didn't. Now it's high time for me to meet him and tell him face to face to stay away from you. No, Dad, no, no. If you just give me the money this once more, I'll straighten out. I promise you. Your me. promises ain't worth a bill of straw. That's what you said last week. You'd straighten out. I told you then I'd give you just one week to do it, and if you didn't, you'd get no more money from me now or ever. Dad, you don't mean Oh, that. don't I? You got yourself into this mess, you get yourself out of it. Tobich can bluff you, but he can't bluff me. Dad, Dad. Huh? What's the matter? Window. Tobich, I just saw him at the window. What? Uh-huh. Now he's gone. He's probably heading for the front door. All right, let him. Turn off the lights, Will. But, Dad... Turn them off. What are you doing? Get in my gun. I'll give this Tobich a reception he ain't looking for. No, Dad, no. Uh, front door, huh? No, look, stay away from that door, Dad. Don't open it. Please don't. Uh, 
Can't see a thing. Now, look, Will, you... Will! Will! Chester Gentry lay dead at his own front door. Will immediately notified Sheriff Bennett's office. The sheriff requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. He joined Sheriff Bennett at the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, looks like an open and shut case, Jace. Kovich came here to get Will, but it was Chester who opened the door and collected the slugs instead. Where was the body, Sheriff? Lying right across the front doorway here. How long ago did the shooting take place? A couple of hours ago. Chester notified me earlier in the evening he'd gotten a call from this Tovich. The call came from Biggerstown, so I went over there to see if I could find him. I located his rooming house, but he'd checked out. Looks like while I was there, he was here. You say Tovich had been bleeding Will and Chester for some time, huh? Yeah, about two months, according to what Chester told me on the phone. Well, let's talk to Will. Oh, oh, Sheriff, come on in. Uh, this is Ranger Pearson, Will. He'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Well, sure, Ranger. How long have you known this Tovich, Will? A couple of months, I guess. And where'd you first meet him? Pete's place, down the highway. That's a roadhouse, Chase. Mm, that where you did your gambling? No, no. Tovich would call me from time to time, tell me he had a game lined up. So I'd meet him at his rooming house in Biggest Town. Who else was in the games? A couple of other fellas, different ones each time. I didn't know any of them. Didn't even know their names. You kept losing to Tovich, didn't you? Yeah, I did. But you kept on playing cards with him. Well, I, I kept thinking my luck would change. Your luck never changes when you're up against a professional gambler. <laughs> Guess I know that now. It's too bad you didn't know it two months ago. Your stepfather might still be alive. Ranger... There just isn't a thing you can say to me that I haven't already said to myself. I've been sitting here for two hours thinking about it. Knowing if I had the guts to straighten out, this wouldn't happen. There's only one thing I hope right now. I hope somehow Dad knows how I feel. All right, Will. What does Tovich look like? Well, pretty ordinary looking fellow. Kind you never notice in a crowd. About my height, I'd say, black hair, regular features, nothing to really set him apart. Mm, it's pretty general. I guess it is, but it's the best I can do. Okay, better get some sleep. You find any tracks outside, Sheriff? Nope, my deputy scarred the yard, but it's too gravelly to hold any kind of tracks, car or foot. Will, uh, do you remember hearing a car pull away from here after the shooting? Why, no, Ranger. Now, come think of it, I, I didn't even hear one come up. Hmm, okay. When it gets light, we'll ride around a little in the back of the ranch, Sheriff, and see if we can pick up any footprints. All right. In the meantime, let's take a run over to Biggerstown and talk to Tovich's landlady. Maybe she can give us a better line on him. Afraid I can't help you much on a description, Ranger. I only got a good look at Tovich once. That was when I rented this room to him two months ago. Mm, it's pretty strange that'd be the only time you saw him, Mrs. Packer. Well, he came and went by night. I'd hear voices in his room sometimes in the evening. A couple of times a woman's voice. But as far as seeing him around, I didn't. You said he checked out earlier tonight. Didn't you see him then? No. He just left an envelope under my door with his key and the money he owed on the room. You think you'd recognize him if you saw him again, Mrs. Packer? Well, I might. I don't know. But to sit down and describe him to you, I'm afraid I can't be much help there. I don't like it, Sheriff. Man's been living in this room for two months. Take a look around you. It's clean. Too clean. Nothing here to give us any line on. Hey, wait a minute. Have you cleaned this room since Tovich checked out? No. I ain't gotten around to it yet. I was figuring on giving it a good swamping out in the morning. I'd like to save you the trouble. What do you mean? I'd like to have one of our men from the lab vacuum the room for you. Well, <laughs> it's my back the way it is. I sure ain't gonna say no. You figure on having the contents of the dust bag analyzed, Jase? Yeah. Tovich has covered his tracks pretty well so far, but... Maybe he doesn't know you can sometimes pick up a lot besides dust with a vacuum cleaner. Mrs. Packer, if you should ever see Tovich again, I'd like you to get in touch with me right away. Well, you can count on that, Ranger. 
Say, I don't hanker to have any killers running loose around my rooming house. Dawn came, and the only thing new on the case was the publicity. The papers were carrying the story with pictures of Chester and Will. The sheriff and I started scouring the country in back of the Gentry Ranch on horseback. <laughs> This is hunting weather, Jace, with all that frost on the ground. Yeah, so far the hunting hasn't been good. Let's see, we're right in line with the back of the ranch house now. Yeah, maybe we better split up and go around. Hey, ooh, hey, oh, hold it. Oh. Take a look on the ground there. Yeah, foot tracks. Coming from the back of the ranch house, too. Mm, judging from the distance between the tracks, he was in a hurry. Come on. Heading straight north for the river, Jace. He could be trying for the New Mexico border. Could be. You know, one thing, it should be pretty easy to follow the tracks in the frost. Yeah. There's something funny about these tracks, though. What do you mean? I don't know yet. Can't just put my finger on it, but we'll keep trailing. See if we can put our finger on Tovich. Come on, Charcoal. Yeah. <laughs> Can't understand why you don't want to cross the river, Jace. Cox led smack into it back there. Yeah, I know it, Sheriff, but let's just keep looking along the bank on this side. Okay, but he probably waded along a spell and then kept going on the other side. What's on the other side? Santa Fe track, about 15 mile away. Yeah, and what's between the river and the tracks? Just open country. That's what I mean. I don't think Tovich would risk 15 miles of open country. Yeah, see your point. Yeah, we'll keep looking along this side, then. Yeah, we don't have to look any farther, Sheriff. Look, there they are. Ooh, oh, oh. ooh, Charky. Hey, they... They sure are. Tracks coming up out of the river and heading back the way we came. But there's still one thing I don't understand. What's that? The shooting took place by 11.30 last night. Tovich could have been halfway across that open country on the other side of the river by dawn. Now, why'd he double back? I think I've got an answer for that, Sheriff. I told you a while back something was bothering me about those tracks. I finally figured out what it is. Oh? Look at the tracks, and then look at the hoof marks of our horses. Well, they look just about the same to me. Hey, they both cut down through the frost. Yeah, that's the point. What time you figure the frost formed on the ground this morning? Mm, between four and five, maybe. And those tracks were made after the frost formed. They cut through it. If they'd been made before the frost, it would have formed over them. Wait a minute. Maybe Tovich realized he killed the wrong man. Maybe he hid around the ranch trying for another crack at Will. And now those tracks are heading toward the ranch again. Come on, Sheriff. We better get back there in a hurry. <laughs> We followed the tracks back to the highway a mile below the ranch and lost them there. Then we headed for the ranch house. There was no sign of life around the place. I don't see Will outside anywhere. Well, his car's in the driveway. I hope we're not too late. Yeah. Will! Will! Oh, morning, Sheriff, Ranger. <sighs> well, that's a relief. Oh, come on in. Well, something the matter? We thought there might be. Can I use your phone? I want to call my office and see if there's anything new. Hey, yes, sir. Back in the hall. Okay, thanks. Ranger, what's the sheriff mean about being relieved to see me? Well, it's possible Tovich hung around here at the ranch last night after the shooting. What? You see or hear anything after we left? It wasn't my imagination. What do you mean? Well, after you fellas left, I locked up tight. About three or four this morning, a sound woke me up. What kind of a sound? Well, like somebody walking around outside. You think it could have been Tovich? I don't know. Well, I've got Dad's gun. If Tovich ever shows up around here again, I'll handle it. Law enforcing's our business, Will. Don't try and take it into your own hands. Yes. Yes, Sheriff. Now, what is it? My deputy just told me that landlady, Miss Packer, phoned the office for you about an hour ago. Mrs. Packer? Yeah, they told her to call out here. Will? Yeah. Did a Mrs. Packer phone me... Oh, a woman phone didn't leave a name, but she did leave a number. I got it written down right here. Thanks. Operator? 
2734J. How long ago did she call, Will? Oh, about an hour ago, I guess. she leave any message? No. no. Just said to ask you to call her. You told her to get in touch with you if she ever saw Tovich again, Jace. Yeah, I know. Hm. No answer. Come on, Sheriff. We better get over to Biggerstown and find out what's on Mrs. Packer's mind. She must have gone out. Her door's unlocked. Mrs. Packer? Mrs. Packer? R- look, Jason. On the table there by the phone. Hmm. Newspaper. Folded to the story of the killing. Well, she can't have gone very far. Coffee's boiling on the hot plate. Hmm. Pot's just about boiled dry. Come on, let's take a look in the next room. You know, it's funny. She'd call and then be... Jace. On the bed. Yeah. Mrs. Packer. Strangled. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death in the Cards, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We were getting nowhere fast on this case. First Chester Gentry, then Mrs. Packer. We questioned all the rumors, but none of them had seen a thing. Then we went back to the sheriff's office. And, Jace, there's no doubt about it at all. Miss Packer was trying to tell you something about Tovich, but he got to her first and killed her to shut her mouth. Yeah, we know who the killer is, all right, but the big question is, where is he? It's just like the earth opened and swallowed him up. Well, every sheriff's office in the state's been alerted. Highway patrol's on the lookout, too, so sooner or later we're bound to... Yeah. Excuse me, Jace. Sheriff Bennett speaking. Oh, yeah, just a minute. Your headquarters, Jace. Captain Stinson. Thanks. Hello, Captain. Just got a report from the lab on those vacuum sweepings you had them take from Tovich's room in Biggestown, Jace. Now, what'd they find? Only items of interest were two or three women's hairs. Red. Hmm. A lot of redheads in Texas, Captain. I'm afraid that's not much help. Maybe more than you think. This hair wasn't naturally red. It was a henna dye job. Judging from the distance between the roots and the dye, the lab figures it was dyed about a week ago. Well, now that's a horse of a different color. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I'll keep you posted. Sheriff, we haven't had any luck finding Tovich, have we? We sure haven't. Okay, now we're going to start looking for Tovich's girl. His girl? How many beauty parlors do you figure there are in Biggerstown? Oh, I don't know, six or seven, maybe? Before the day's over, we'll know exactly how many there are. We're going to visit them all. The sheriff had underestimated the town. There were ten of them. We had no luck on the first seven, and then, just at dark, we hit number eight. There we found an operator who remembered giving a henna dye job to a girl named Thelma Parrish about a week ago. We learned that Thelma was a waitress in a coffee shop, so I parked my car around the corner and we dropped in on her. Well, you men look like you could use a nice cup of coffee. Nothing I'd like better right now than having a pretty red-headed waitress pour me one, ma'am. <laughs> Why, thank you, Ranger. Coming up. What do you think, Jace? I think maybe. Cream? Uh, black, please. They're black here, too. Well, here you are. Thanks. Hey, seen your boyfriend lately? Boyfriend? Tovich. Who? Tovich. You must have me mixed up with somebody else, Ranger. I don't know anybody by that name. Are you real sure about that, ma'am? Well, of course I am. A girl's sure who she does know and who she doesn't. Well, either I'm mistaken or you're lying to me. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but I do know better than lie to a Ranger. I hope so. Well, come on, Sheriff. We better be getting back to your office. Okay, Jason. Here's for the coffee. Thanks. 
Sorry I can't help you any about what's his name. So am I. This way, Sheriff. Where are we going? Across the street. Yeah, but the car's on this side, around the corner. Keep walking. She's watching us from inside. Oh. Think she was lying? That's what I want to find out. She seemed pretty sure of herself. Okay, we're out of her line of sight now. Let's get in this doorway, quick. Good. We're in the shadows here. She can't spot us from across the street. Now we just keep an eye on the front of that coffee shop Chase, and... look. She's coming outside. Uh-huh. Yeah. False alarm. She's just washing the windows. Yeah? Well, that's the fastest wash job I've ever seen. She's heading inside again. She came out to make sure we'd gone. Come on. We'll work away along the sidewalk until we can see across the street into the coffee shop. Yeah, but she may spot us. Hey, hold it. She's on the phone with her back to us. She was lying, all right. Probably calling Tovich right now. Sheriff, how about slipping into the drugstore and tracing that call? Mm -hmm. I can keep an eye on the front of the shop from my car. I'll meet you there. <laughs> The sheriff disappeared into the drugstore. I waited in my car. A couple of minutes later, he came over and got in, wearing a very puzzled look. Must be some mistake, Jason. Yeah, what do you mean? That waitress, she just telephoned the Gentry Ranch. I don't think there is any mistake, Sheriff. And right now, it doesn't surprise me much. Yeah, but as far as we know, the only one at the Gentry Ranch is Will. Yeah, but Will's going to have company as soon as we can make it there. Wait a minute. You trying to say that Will Gentry... Sheriff, it looks like there is no Tovich and never has been. I guess the boy we've been up against right from the start is Will Gentry. I radioed KTXA to set up a roadblock on the highway ten miles each way from the Gentry Ranch in case Will should take off before we could get there. And I jammed the gas pedal to the floor and held it there. Jace, you're leaving me way behind. Will Gentry. Looks like I was way behind for a while, too. But looking back on it, it all falls into place. We know Will was always after money from his stepfather, Chester. And he invented the story about a gambler named Tovich as an excuse to get that money? He even went so far as to rent a room in Biggerstown under that name. But when Chester cracked down and threatened to disinherit him, Will used the same Tovich device to kill Chester. That way, he'd get all Chester's money. So when Chester opened the front door, thinking Tovich was outside, there wasn't anybody there at all. And it was Will who plugged him. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10. Go ahead, KTXA. Unit 320, station at Tucker's Junction. Unit 256, station at Biggerstown, turn off. Unit 10, 10-4. KTXA, clear. Well, we got the roadblock set up. Tucker's Junction's about five miles the other side of the Gentry Ranch, isn't it? Yep. And with another highway patrol car back of us at the Biggerstown turnoff, looks like we got Will bottled up tight if he makes a run for it. There's no side roads off the highway for six or seven miles along here. Good. As soon as we get the top of this rise, we ought to be able to spot the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, ranch house only a mile or so from here, Jace. It was Will who made those tracks in the frost then, huh? He heard me say we'd start trailing in the morning. I guess he figured on giving us something to trail. Yeah, and that explains Miss Packer's murder, too. She must have seen Will's picture in the paper, recognized him as Tovich, so she tried to phone you. And when she called the ranch house, Will knew he had to shut her mouth for keeps. He probably got back from killing her just before we showed up at the ranch house after the trailing. There's the ranch house, only a half mile more. Now wait, the taillight's swinging out on the highway. He's making a run for it. What kind of cars he drive? Gray sedan, isn't it? Yep. Unit 10 to all units in roadblock. Subject, Will Gentry, attempting getaway. Proceeding east on Highway 19 in gray sedan. Unit 10 pursuing. Unit 203 to Unit 10. Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 203. Unit 203 on Highway 19, three miles west of Tucker's Junction. That's only a couple of miles east of us, Jace. Proceed west on Highway 19, Unit 203. Unit 10, clear. Yeah, we got him bottled up for sure, Jace. We're backstopped at both ends, and we're coming at him from both ends. It's a squeeze, clear. I sure hope so. Unit 10 to Unit 203. Unit 203, go ahead, Unit 10. Have you sighted Gentry's car yet? Not yet, Unit 10. We'll report contact. Unit 10, clear. I don't get it, Sheriff. 
He should have spotted Gentry by this time. We're almost together. Here, watch it, Jace. Sharp bend in the road just ahead. Just past this drive-in movie here. Yeah, I see it. The only way Gentry could get off the highway is to ditch his car, and I don't think he'd do that. Hey, a red light coming at us. That must be Unit 203. He's stopping, too. But where's Will? No sign of Gentry? Come, Jake. No, but there aren't any side roads at all. He couldn't have vanished into thin air. Hey, wait a minute. That drive-in movie we just passed. You think he turned in? It's the only place he could have turned in. Come on. We went back to the drive-in theater, stationed the highway patrol car at the exit, then the sheriff and I talked to the theater manager. He remembered a gray sedan pulling in there a few minutes before. He'd sent it to the rear aisle, so the three of us circled around the theater on the outside of the fence and then came in through a small gate in the rear. But Gentry's car wasn't in the back row. But he's got to be in this back row, Ranger. That's where I sent him. Look, there's a vacant spot in the row. One in the next row ahead. He could have wormed his way forward a few rows. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people do that trying to get a better spot. About 200 cars in here. It's going to be like looking for a needle. Hey, hold it. Three aisles up, near the side. Yeah, that's his car, all right. Gonna take him now, Jason? We can't. There's too many cars around him. It's a cinch he won't come peacefully. Somebody might get shot. If we could only get the car on each side of him to get clear... I could make an announcement on the public address. No, that's no good. He'd probably start shooting. I can't warn the car on each side. Will would spot me. Same goes for you, Sheriff. Want me to do it? You? Oh, I don't know. It'd be pretty... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I think I got it. You go up to the car on this side of Will, tell him to clear out in exactly one minute. Then go to Will's car, tell him you're checking the reception on those speakers they hang on the side of their cars. And then go to the car the other side of him, tell them to clear out in two minutes. Good idea. That way, maybe Will won't get suspicious. Thirty seconds after the second car leaves, turn on all the lights. Okay, I'll give it a whirl. See you after it's all over. I hope. Watched the manager go along the line of cars. He worked his way to Will's car, then passed it to the one beyond. Then he headed for the projection booth. So far, so good. Seconds ticked by. At the end of the first minute, the car this side of Will pulled out. Another minute went by. And the car the other side of Will got going. He's out in the open now, Jason. Yeah. Twenty seconds till the light's gone. Come on. John, you can't. Get just a little closer. I'll take him from this side. Hey, Jace. He's starting up. He must have got suspicious. He won't get far. You hit his car. Will! Come out of that car with your hands in the air. There go the lights, Tom. That's coming out all right, Ranger. Look out, Jace! Oh. Come on, Sheriff. You okay, Jace? Uh, yeah. Are you sure knocked him down, Pablo? Uh, uh, hit him in the shoulder. Why don't you finish me off? That's up to the state of Texas, Will, not me. But I think they'll oblige you, all right? Will Gentry was tried and convicted of the murders of Chester Gentry and Leona Packer. On the morning of April 12, 1948... He was executed in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. Although the Texas Rangers is a highly organized law enforcement agency, the men themselves are rugged individualists. One ranger in particular that I know of carries his six shooters with only five shells in each gun. One day he was asked why he did this. If the hammer's resting on an empty chamber, he said, the gun can't be fired accidentally. But, said his interested friend, with only five bullets instead of six in the gun, aren't you endangering your own position? Maybe so, he said with a grin, but if you can't hit your target with five shells, the sixth one won't do you much good anyhow. Good night, folks. See you next week. in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. (laughs) 
Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Farley Bear, Jeanette Nolan, Byron Kane, Mike Barrett, and Ernie Newton. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bob Reif, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Remember all the delightful troubles that beset Mr. Blandings when he built his dream house? Well, starting next Sunday afternoon, you can hear the further adventures of the beleaguered Mr. Blandings and his wonderful wife, Muriel. It's top listening for the entire family next Sunday and Sundays thereafter when Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Stay tuned for the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the symphony on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Blood Harvest. It is a moonless midnight, September 16th, 1947. A truck without lights is parked in a cultivated field several miles from Fairvale, Texas. In the darkness, two men are perspiring freely as they load bales of seasoned alfalfa hmm? onto the truck. Yeah. How many more we got to go, Slim? Uh, 15, 20, that's all. Uh, now we can get it all on here, then. This will be the last load. That suits me fine. The sooner you get off the place with it, better. Come on. Yeah, whoa, take it easy, will you, Slim? How about time out for a smoke? A smoke? Are you out of your mind, Trent? Oh, we're a half mile from the house. And besides, you said Mullen was asleep. Look, don't give me an argument. All right, all right. But I moved more than 200 bales of this stuff tonight. I'm going to rest for a minute. If you don't like it, load the rest of it yourself. Okay, don't get hot about it. I'm just as tired as you are. Now sit on a running board. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mullen's sure going to be surprised when he gets a look at this field tomorrow. Yeah, he sure is. What do we get for this stuff? About thirty dollars a ton. Ain't bad. Bound to clear almost two hundred bucks a piece. Yeah. Could make more than that running a couple of head of cattle without working up this pig sweat, though. Sure, smart guy. Run cattle and get picked up and sent to the pen. Maybe there ain't as much money in alfalfa, but one thing about it, there ain't no brand marks on the bales either. Nobody can say it ain't yours once you get in the clear with it. Yeah, I guess you got a point. Think Mullen's liable to suspicion you when he finds his field stripped tomorrow? Oh, not a chance. I'm an old war buddy, ain't I? And he saw me taking a sleeping pill before we turned in tonight. <laughs> At least he thinks he saw me take it. <laughs> it's a good thing he ain't seeing you take this alfalfa or you'd lose your job for sure. After tomorrow, I can afford to lose it. The farm work ain't for men, it's for horses. Hey, come on, we rested long enough. I want to get you away from here. Okay. <sighs> Now, give me that pitchfork. I'll push those last two bales back and make more room on the tail of the yeah, truck. Here it is. I got to act real surprised tomorrow. When... What's the matter, Slim? Shh. There's something moving. I don't hear nothing. There it is again. Maybe it's Mullen. Maybe he woke up. Keep quiet, Trent. Who's out in this field? It is him. Shut up. You better answer me. I can see the outline of your truck. Slim, I got to start up and get out of here. No. He woke up. He must know I'm not in the house. So pile in the truck and come with me, quick. Hey, go to jail, lady, you fool. No. I'll slide around behind the truck. You stay here until he comes up to you. Yeah, but I know... Don't you, I tell you. 
Who are you? Talk up fast. It's me, Mullen. Harry Trent. Harry Trent, huh? You lost, Trent? What are you doing in my field in the middle of the night with a truck full of mile south? Oh, uh, well, Save it, Trent. West Slim, where to run to? I didn't run any place, Mullen. You know. Don't move. There's a pitchfork you feel against your ribs. Just march back to the house. What are you going to do to him, Slim? I'm going to lend him my bottle of sleeping pills and see to it that he takes an overdose of them. It's nice, clean, and quiet. That idea would be great, Slim, if I'd hold still for it. But I ain't about to hold still. Look out, Slim. Punch him, Trent. Let go of that fort, Mullen. <laughs> now, Mullen, here's something you don't have to hold still for. <laughs> but you'll hold still this time. <laughs> you killed him. You killed him. You shut up. Stop that and shut up. Uh, we gotta run, Slim. We gotta you don't do nothing. Get that load out of here and sell it like we planned. Then keep your mouth shut. If you don't, I'll shut it for you. <laughs> Just before dawn of the next morning, a hound from a neighboring farm came across the body of Robert Mullen. Its baying attracted its master, who called the sheriff. The sheriff requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. There's a body, Ranger. Black hound dog over there came across it this morning, set up a holler. Owner heard her, knowed she'd find something and come around. I see. Which one owns the dog? Fellow in the Mackinac, Sam Richardson. His farmer joins this one along the east fence. Who are the other two men? Harry Trent. Farmer on the north is his. And Slim Fireman. Slim worked this place with Mullen. They was buddies in the war or something. You want to talk to him? Yeah, in a minute. Anybody touch that pitchfork? Nope, not even me yet. I figured it must be the murder weapon, blood all over the prongs. Hard to read prints off that handle, though. Yeah. Marks on the body show Mullen was jabbed twice. Once would have been plenty. I, uh, sent for the J.P., but I don't think we need an inquest to tag this as murder. No, but he'll have to order a medical examination to establish the time of death. Hmm. Hmm, Mullen felt kind of funny. The left leg bent in under him. Well, there's a reason for that. Pull up the pants leg and you'll see. Yeah. That explains it, all right, artificial leg. He in some kind of an accident? If you can call Okinawa an accident, you get the beach there with the first Marines. Lost a leg and an eye. Left eye's glass. He could have picked an easier life than farming. Did he have any family? Sister, Ellie, lives over at Holtzville. Guess I'll have to bring her the news. You could call the local minister at Holtzville. He can tell her better than you can. And we can drive over and see her later and find out if she knows anything. That's a good idea. I'll talk to these other fellows now. Okay. They uh, don't seem to know much, though. They may know when Mullen was last seen alive. As often a man gets pitchforked to death out in his own fields. Yeah. Uh, Fellas, this is Ranger Jace Pearson. Ranger, this is Sam Richardson. Howdy. Harry Trent. Hello. Slim Fireman. I know you. Richardson, the sheriff tells me your dog found the body. That's right. Oh, it must have been about uh, 4 a.m. I was just getting out of bed when I heard her, so I come a-running. You always run out and investigate when you hear one of your hounds baying? Nope, but that black hound of mine's a good one. And I ain't never heard a dog sound off like she did. I see. When did you see Mullen last alive? Yesterday morning. Passed each other along the fence and said howdy. How about you, Mr. Trent? Uh, I hadn't seen him for a couple of days. Reckon Slim here saw him last then. How about it? Well, sure, I reckon I did. Last night we ate, and then I turned in early. Hmm. Then this happened during the night. Must have, as far as I know. Why would Mullen come out to this field at night? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't even know he'd left the house until Richardson here come pounding on the door and woke me up this morning after he found the body. You live right on the place, Slim? Uh huh. How come you didn't hear Richardson's dog? Well, I'm sleeping kind of heavy. I took a sleeping pill last night. Must have knocked me out good. Had a rough day yesterday. What do you mean, rough? Well, all the extra chores, loading the alfalfa from this field onto the truck. I was wondering how come there were so few bales from such a big cutting. Well, Mullen had a buyer for most of it, I reckon. Anyhow, he carted it off. Yeah, I see the tire tracks. Any idea who he sold it to? No, he didn't say. Think somebody paid him for the stuff, then came back to rob him of the money, Jace? Could be, Sheriff. Except that Mullen made the robin mighty convenient by coming out into this field at night. 
When we learn why he came out here, we'll be learning a lot. After a while, the justice of the peace showed up and took charge of the body. The sheriff made his call to the minister at Holtzville so he could break the news to Mullen's sister. We gave her a couple of hours to get a grip and then drove over to see her. <laughs> He was, he was only here last Sunday, spending the day with him, playing with a baby, and arguing with Dan. Who's Dan? My husband. Well, what were they arguing about? What? I didn't mean a real argument. Politics, cost of living, you know how men get talking. <laughs> and, and now he's dead. Take it easy, Ellie. <laughs> That's your brother's picture over the fireplace, isn't it? Yes, in his uniform, just before he went overseas in the war, before he was hurt. Anybody you know of who might gain anything by having your brother out of the way? No, he never made any enemy. Yes, it was robbery like we figured before, Jace. No money on him and none in the house that we could find. Mm, might have had time to bank the crop money yesterday. We can check that with the bank. Might as well go then. Ellie, you shouldn't be here alone at a time like this. <laughs> The minister's coming back later. Why don't you call Dan and have him come home from work? He's away for a few days on a business trip. Oh, away on a business trip, huh? Who's he working for? He's buying and selling for Hatton's Feed and Grain Company. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Well, if there's anything I can do, just holler. Bye, Ellie. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye. You, you got to find out who killed my brother. You can't let him get away with it. We'll try not to, ma'am. I never thought how her husband's job might fit into this. Buying and selling feed and grain, huh? Mullins sold that alfalfa most likely man he'd sell it to would be his own brother-in-law. It's something we're going to check on. Hop in. We'll put out a radio pickup for him? No, oh, we'll drive over to the Hatton Feed and Grain. They'll know where he is and we'll pick him up ourselves. <laughs> Hatton's Feed and Grain Company told us the area that Mullen's brother-in-law, Dan, was working. We caught up to him next morning, making a selling stop at a dairy farm. That must be Dan's car there by the barn. Hatton Company emblem on it. Yeah, let's find him. There he is. Other end of the barn, leaning on a stall. Must be the owner he's talking to. Call him down here. We don't have to. He sees us coming this way now. Watch out for any sudden moves, just in case. Uh, Howdy, Sheriff. Is it for me? Ranger and I'd like a word with you. Uh, reckon it's about Ellie's brother. You heard about it, huh? Yeah, on my car radio this morning. I called Ellie a little while ago. She told me you'd been to see her. A couple stops I just got to make around here, and then I'm heading for home. When did you see Mullen last? Two days ago, when I started out on this trip. You stopped by his place? That's right. Social call or business? Business. Made a bit on his alfalfa. We just about finished sweating, ready to be hauled for storage. How'd you pay him for it, by cash or company check? I didn't pay him for it, Ranger. He said it wasn't for sale. You better be sure of that, Dan. What do you mean? He means that that alfalfa was sold and moved just before Mullen was killed, the same day you stopped there. Whoever told you that's a liar. It's no lie, Dan. We saw it with our own eyes. Everything was hauled from there except maybe a dozen bales. I don't care what you saw. I know that alfalfa wasn't for sale, to me or anybody else. What makes you so sure of that? I'll tell you what makes me so sure. You can check it with the bank. Bob told me he'd made arrangements for a bank loan to buy 20 head of dairy cattle. That's why I'm sure. He was getting them in next month. And he needed that alfalfa for winter forage. He couldn't have sold it. Not to anybody. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Blood Harvest, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Mullins Bank verified the loan for buying the dairy herd. Unless he'd changed his mind suddenly, Mullen wouldn't have sold the feed he'd been needing for his own stock. The sheriff and I headed back for Mullen's farm. Don't see Slim around any place. Maybe into the funeral home. 
Let's take a look at the barn. We've looked at the barn before, Jace. No way we could miss a couple hundred bales of alfalfa. No, but we might have missed something we weren't looking for the last time. Just look up. You see the lot is almost empty. He didn't need much forage with just one horse to feed. No, I'm not looking for forage. Here's what I'm interested in. Just a bunch of scrap lumber. And a keg of nails. Just about what he'd need to build stalls for that dairy herd. Now, uh, Mullen was too far ahead with his plans to change his mind, if you ask me. Sure looks that way. Where'd Mullen keep his hay truck? That vehicle shed out back? Yeah. Come on. What do you want to see, Jace? The truck that Slim said he and Mullen loaded that alfalfa on. Looks like the shed is locked. Yeah. Oh, no, it isn't. It's the wooden peg stuck through the lock ratchet. We can pull it. I'll help you roll her back. Yeah. There's the truck. This the only truck he's got? Yep. If this truck was used to haul alfalfa bales, they must have been tighter than any bales I've ever seen. Look at that truck bed. Clean as a whistle. Not a straw on the floor. Mm hmm. Hey, Sheriff. This is the truck that was loaded out in that field. You can't be sure of that just because the bed is clean. No, but I can be sure by the tires. Look at them. Treads worn down almost smooth. The tire marks we saw out in the field were well marked. Plenty of tread. Hey, that's right. They were. Come on. Take Mullen's horse from the barn, throw a saddle on it. I'll get charcoal out of my trailer and we'll take a little ride. Where to? Out to the fields first, where I can make a plastic cast of that tire tread. Truck was loaded heavy. Compression was deep enough to hold. Why can't we drive out? I want to cut across the neighboring farms, too, and see if we can find any matching treads in other fields. We'll see the ground better as we move on horseback. It's as easy to drive around the farms and check the tires on the trucks like we did here. Yeah, but I don't want to be seen doing that. If we scare the man we're after, he might run before we get to him. Okay, I'll have this nag ready in a minute. If you're right, Jace, Slim Ferryman has been lying about moving the alfalfa. Easy, boy. We'll find out. If he was lying, it'll explain why Mullen was out to that field at night. Because it'll mean that the crop was being stolen at night. And he was killed when he saw who was stealing it. How long does it take that cast to dry, Jace? I'll be ready in a minute. Well, that would be a lot of truck tires with that same tread. Sure, but this piece I'm making a cast of has a cut mark across part of the tread. Oh, I see. Find that same mark again someplace else. We can make another cast and use for evidence. Here, this is dry now. How's that, Sheriff? Good, clear impression, Jace. Come on. Let's ride. Checked the neighboring farms. Sam Richardson's place was clear, and so were the two others. And we cut through the north fence to Mullum's farm and into the acreage owned by Harry Trent. Looks like Trent moved his alfalfa crop too, Jay's fields are clear. Yeah. Where's the farmhouse? Other side of that patch of trees. Good. That'll keep us covered. Keep your eyes on the ground. Right. Hey, hold it. Ooh. Hold it. What is it? Nothing. Tractor marks there. Not what we're looking for. Oh. Well, let's keep going. Hey, go. There's quite a bit of straw on the ground over to the right, Sheriff. Let's move that way. Hey, boy. Yeah, Sharky. Yeah. Probably Trent had his bail stacked there. Huh. He sure did. That's what we're looking for. Ooh, ooh, Sharky. Ooh, easy. Ooh. Kind of dim, Jace, but they're the same tread, all right. Yeah. It looks like the same cut mark in the tread. I'm going to make another cast. Then after dark, we can slip in and take a look at Trent's barn and his truck. We slipped back that night. Trent's truck tires were the ones we were looking for. Heavy duty. We went from the vehicle shed to the barn. Pretty dark night, Jase. Hardly seeing here either. Yeah. See enough to find what I want. It's a ladder to the left. Hi, right, here it is. All right, I'm going to climb up. Give me your flashlight. Here you are. Anything up there? Just a few bales. I reckon Trent sold most of his alfalfa crop, too. Even if he had Mullen's crop here, no way we could prove it. That's where you're wrong, Sheriff. If Trent had it, we're going to prove it. 
cleared the farm without being spotted. Got to my car and drove back to town. Robert Mullen's wake had just ended at the funeral home as we pulled up at the sheriff's office. We didn't have to be so careful out at Trent's place, Jace. There he is going toward his car. Must have come in to pay his respect. Uh, he just came out of the door of that cafe. Oh, look who's in there at the counter. Slim Fireman. Yeah, we could use some coffee. Come on. Well, howdy, Sheriff and Ranger. Howdy, May. How's the coffee? Try stirring it, and it'll fling the spoon right back at you. <laughs> that sounds strong enough. Pour a couple. Yeah, all right. Mind if we sit with you, Slim? Help yourself. Yeah, got a line on who killed Mullen yet? No. Too bad Mullen never mentioned the name of the man he was selling that alfalfa to. No, too bad. You think he might have mentioned it to one of the neighbors, Sam Richardson, maybe, or Harry Trent? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. I guess it isn't likely. man who doesn't tell his plans to an old buddy living right in the same house with him, I guess he wouldn't tell anybody. Well, here's your java, Sheriff. Thanks. Ranger. You and Mullen go all through the war together? No, just part of it. Mm -hmm. Where'd you meet? South Pacific? Uh, no, here in the States. I, uh, I was a ward man at the General Hospital. Oh, then you weren't in action together. No. I see. I, I thought you were real close friends. We were. Who says we weren't? Well, take it easy. Nobody said so. I just meant you... You weren't as close as buddies are when they're under fire together. We were plenty close, and don't let nobody tell you different. Mullen was the best friend I ever had, see? Sure. When you get the guy who killed him, I'd... I'd like to be there to watch when they strap the rat in the electric chair. I know just how you feel. I'll do my best to arrange that for you. Um, here's your money, May. Oh, thanks, Liam. Uh, I'm going back to the farm and get some sleep if I can. Hardly had any since this happened. Oh, it's too bad. Maybe you ought to take one of your sleeping pills. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I will. Good night. Good night, Sheriff. Good night, Slim. You sure rattled his teeth, Jace. He was pretty frank about his service record, though. Yeah, only because he knew I could check it if he lied. Let's skip this coffee. I want to see Ellie and her husband, Dan. <laughs> Ellie and Dan were keeping a lonesome night vigil beside the body of Robert Mullen. We beckoned Dan outside. What is it? I don't want to leave Ellie alone too long. I'm afraid you'll have to leave her alone for a while if you want to help us spring the trap on the man who killed your brother-in-law. You know who did it? I think so. But I need your help to prove it. You gotta help her. What do you want? How much acreage did Mullen have in alfalfa? Looks like seven or eight acres. Eight's right. You know how much it yield? About two ton to an acre. Sixteen ton all told. That's a good yield for this year. He took good care of his land. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. Sheriff, we saw Trent's alfalfa acreage. I'd say he'd cut about six acres. But then? You don't have to say about. Six acres is right. How do you know? I bought Trent's alfalfa crop for my company. Good. How much? Almost 12 tons. Same acre yield as Bob Mullen. 12 tons. Are you sure that's all? Of course I'm sure. A feed and grain companies keep a record of everybody they purchase from? Sure. Can the lots be identified? I mean, are they tagged or stored in such a way you could tell who they were brought from? Yeah, they are. What are you aiming at, Jace? Final proof to break Trent down? Dan, I want you to come with me. We'll get one of the bales Trent sold to your company, and then we're going to wake up every other feed and grain buyer in the county to see if he sold any more than 12 tons. We got what we were after. The day after Mullen was killed, Trent had sold an additional 15 tons to another company almost 50 miles away. We got a sample bale and brought it back to the sheriff's office. Hey, put it down here, Dan. Yeah. So Trent did sell more of it, huh? Fifteen tons more. Well, see how you can tell this bale from the other one. You can when you weigh them. Trent's bales averaged 110 pounds to the bale on his own stuff. The bales in this second batch are tighter packed, about 140 pounds to the bale. Hey, wait a minute, Ranger. There's something else different, too. I just noticed. Look at the wire on the bales. Mm -hmm. Looks the same to me. Maybe, but you're not as used to seeing baling wire as I am. Wire on the bales Trent sold me is 16 gauge. Wire on this other bale is 14 gauge. Bob Mullen always used 14 gauge. Come on, Sheriff. 
Let's get Trent and make him talk. Once he opens up, we'll see where Slim Fairman fits. Chase, I see the picture's clear as you do now, but how are we going to prove that this second batch of alfalfa was stolen from Mullen's place? We don't have to prove it. Trent's the one who has to do the proving. We do things big in Texas, but he's the first man who ever sold 27 tons of alfalfa from six acres. Let's go. <laughs> It was still dark when we turned in the road to Trent's farmhouse, and the light went on inside as we came to a stop. Trent came to the door. Oh! Oh, it's you fellas. I heard a car. I... You thought it was somebody else? No, no, no. I didn't know who it was. Oh. I thought you might be expecting Slim Fairman. Uh, no, no. Why would Slim come here? Take a few lessons in farming, maybe? So you could show them how to raise 27 tons of alfalfa on six acres? 26? You must have raised that much, Trent, because you sold that much. The 15 tons of it belonged to Mullen. He bailed heavier and used 14-gauge wire while you used 16-gauge. Uh, I bought Mullen's crop. Why would he sell it to you instead of his brother-in-law, Dan? I mean, uh, I, I hauled it for him. He thought the price would be better someplace else. Not enough to haul it 50 miles. And besides, you made that sale yesterday. After Mullen was killed. I had to do it. I was in a trap. If I told you about it, Slim would have killed me. Did he kill Mullen? Were you an eyewitness? Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw him do it. I never touched Mullen. Where's Slim now? I I thought you were him when you drove up. He's coming here this morning. I got to check for Mullen's alfalfa, and Slim was going to pick it up and take it someplace for cash. And... There's a car coming now, Jason. Handcuff Trent to the door now of that closet. Quick. Right. I didn't kill Shut him. Up. Come on, Sheriff. Slim won't stop. He'll see my car as he makes the turn for the house. He saw it. He's turning around. Get his tires. That stopped him. He's running for it, Chase. Move off to that side. The car is shielding him. Right. Stop running, Slim. You can't beat a bullet. He ducked into the bullet, Chase. Circle in from the side and keep the door covered. I'm going in after him. Ray of dawn was washing across the sky, but the barn was in deep shadow. I slipped in along the side wall and moved slowly toward the stalls. I didn't see what came at me. I just sensed it hurtling through the air, and I threw myself to the side, hit the ground, and fired. Did you get him, Chase? You all right? Yeah. He threw that sickle at me from the stall. I didn't see him. I don't even know how I hit him. I just felt it coming and fired. Mighty good aim. He's dead. So is Bob Mullen. Let's get Trent and take him in. For his complicity in the robbery and murder of Robert Mullen, Harry Trent was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for 50 years. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. The equipment of a Texas Ranger includes a pair of six guns, a rifle, a shotgun, and other weapons. Not to mention his horse, horse trailer, automobile, and scientific crime detection apparatus. However, there's been a fictional addition to the equipment as the result of motion pictures. An addition that has the Rangers scratching their heads ruefully. It came to the attention of one Ranger recently as he passed two small boys on a street. The small fry turned to stare at him. The ranger got quite a shock when he heard one of them say, Oh, shucks. He ain't a real Texas ranger. He ain't got a guitar. <laughs> well, such is the influence of modern fiction. But fortunately, the criminals know the truth. When they see a real Texas ranger, they don't look for a guitar. They look for the quickest means of transportation. They want distance, not music. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, Herb Bygren, Tom Tully, Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, and Gigi Pearson. 
This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Al Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Here's news of two outstanding musical events. This Saturday, January 27th, Arturo Toscanini begins the first of a new series with the NBC Symphony. And starting Monday, January 29th, the Boston Pops Orchestra will be heard in a new Monday evening concert series. They call infantile paralysis the visible crippler. It strikes without mercy any place, anywhere. You can fight him with your dimes and dollars, though. Send them today to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Join the 1951 March of Dimes. Remember, Arturo Toscanini once again conducts the symphony next Saturday on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Loggers Larceny. It is mid-afternoon, September 7th, 1938. Two loggers employed by the Gulf Lumber Company are marking timber near a lonely stretch of company logging road in the Piney Woods region of East Texas. Yeah, there. Cutting crew ought to be able to see that, Mark. Yeah. Well, looks like that's the last decent stick left in this stand of timber, too. Uh, plenty more trees in the woods. Come on, we'll cross the creek and start working that stand up on the other side of the road. Uh... We're already marked an awful lot of trees today. I think my axe is heavier than yours. <laughs> I could do with a breather. Yeah, catch it on the round end. Come on. You'll get used to that axe. I told you I'd make a logger out of you. Just stick with me, kid. I'll put muscles like this on your arms. Air on your chest, iron in your fist. Yeah, if I live through it. <laughs> Bull, I'm about done in. Oh, man, that creek sure looks good. Yeah, don't let it fool you. Ain't fit to drink down here. Sawdust pile at the mill poison it. Well, what do we do, Wade? Sure, ain't deep enough to swim, is it? But he want to ride across piggyback. Hey, Bull, look. What? Over there on the other side. Up there against that old cutover stump. That's the car. Yeah, upside down, all smashed up. Well, come on. Somebody might be hurt. Hey, Bullet, that's one of the company cars on the mill. Yeah, I see. Sure is wrecked, ain't it? Yeah. Hey, smell that gasoline. Tank's busted wide open. Sure, good thing there wasn't a spark. Uh huh. There'd been some fire if that gas had caught. Hey, look here, kid. In the front seat. Who, who is it, boy? It's old man Hutton. What's left of him? He's the paymaster. Come on, we better get him out of there. No, we can't do nothing for him. But get a load of this bank bag. Hey, that's full of money. Uh-huh. Payroll for the mill. Boy, what are you doing? What are you stuffing that money in your shirt for? Look, kid, we ain't been around here, understand? Hey, you've got no right to that money. Who's got a better one? Who's even going to know it's missing? Unless you shoot off your mouth. You, you twist my arm. I'll twist your neck right off your shoulders if you let out one word. Oh, for the law. Oh, forget the law. Just remember you'll get the worst beating you ever had. You understand? Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, that's being smart. Here, throw this sack back in the car while I got my shirt buttoned. There's still some money left in it. Sure, all the coins and a few bills. No use being a hog, is it? Besides, this is going to look right. Throw it back in the car, I said. Sure, boy. Sure. Ah, uh, you got a match? A crazy bull, a match with all that gasoline spilled around here? Wait and see how crazy. Give me a match. Okay. Here. There's only one left in the box. Is all you got? Yeah. Well, we'll make this and count in. Now, 
Get back out of the way. The frantic mill superintendent waited until evening to report the missing paymaster and money. Sheriff Stanton immediately contacted the Texas Rangers. An all-points bulletin for the apprehension of the man was sent out, and Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. He arrived at the mill with the sheriff early the next morning. Here's the mill office, Jace. Might as well start there. The quicker we can get a line on Hutton, the better. Yeah. If he's making a run for it, he's already got a big lead on us. Sure. Sure. I've been waiting for you. Uh, meet Ranger Pearson, Mr. Browning. Mr. Browning's the mill superintendent. Howdy, Mr. Browning. Yeah, pleased to meet you, Ranger. Anything new here? No. I, uh, I'm kind of inexperienced at this sort of thing. I sure have been waiting for you. The delay is my fault. It was nearly sunup when I met the sheriff. We took time enough for breakfast and to drag the bank teller out of bed. He says your man Hutton left the bank about a half hour after closing time yesterday. Yeah, they waited until the street doors were closed before they started making up Hutton's orders for mixed currency. Now, they usually work it that way at the bank on paydays. $18,000 is a lot of money to count out, you know. Well, we not only know how much money we're looking for, but how much of each denomination. I've got Hutton's list. The bank teller gave me a copy of it. He sure must have slipped out quiet. Not a soul in town saw him after he left the bank. No telling which direction he headed. Uh, would you have a picture of him by any chance, Mr. Browning, to sort of amplify the description we've already sent out? Well, there may be one among his belongings in his shack. You know, Sheriff, I, I still can't believe Bob absconded with that money. $18,000 is a lot of temptation, Mr. Browning. I know it, but Bob Hutton's been with us for years. I'd have trusted him with every asset the company owns. I, I just don't know what to think now. We won't rule out any possibility. Before we go through Hutton's things, I'd like to talk to any of your crew who might have been working near the road yesterday afternoon. Well, Foreman Bull Evans and his helper were marking a stand of timber over by Pine Creek. They're down in the drying yard this morning. The rest of the crew's out in the woods. How do they feel about Hutton not showing up? Well, quite a few of them wanted to dig up a rope and go hunting for him. But Bull Evans talked them out of that. Let's go find this foreman of yours. He sounds like some talker. Maybe he can tell us something. Uh, put your shoulder to the dolly, kid. Here. Yeah, that's good. I will stack this load of sheathing beside that last bunch of two bys. Stand them on in and slide them in against the ridge pole. There. Okay. This green stuff's as heavy as lead. Stack it up there straight. Want the whole blame rack to come down on top of you? What's the matter with you? You're nervous? No. No, I... I ain't nervous. Give me a hand, won't you, Bull? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like I told you, keep your mouth shut and nothing will happen to you. Okay. You got that next stick now. Yeah. Like that? Maybe we'll make a logger out of you yet. Bull. Bull, look, here comes the boss and the ranger. Yeah. And the sheriff. So what? Grab that next stick and remember what I told you about talking. Ah, hello, boss. Sheriff, find old man Hutton on the payroll yet? Well, this is Ranger Pearson. Oh, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Ranger and the sheriff want to ask you and the boy some questions. Well, sure, sure. Glad to help. Hey, kid, hold it a minute there, will you? Yeah, sure. I understand you were working somewhere near the road from town yesterday afternoon. No, we were working a stand over on Pine Creek. Sometimes it was near the road, sometimes it wasn't. Did you see anything of Hutton or the company car he was driving? We didn't see any car, did we, kid? No. Did you hear a car going either way on the road? Yeah, we didn't hear nothing, we didn't see nothing. I'm afraid you're barking up a wrong tree, Ranger. How's that, Bull? Old man Hutton wasn't crazy. He'd seen a chance at a lot of money and he took it. He never headed back this way from town. You'll pick him up someplace long gone from here. All right, Bo. That's all. Yeah, come on, kid. Let's get back to work. Now, wait a minute. I haven't talked to your helper yet. Well, Bo told you we didn't see nothing. I don't know nothing about that money. We're looking for a man right now, son. Not the money he was carrying. Are you as convinced as Bull here that he ran off with the company payroll? Well, I... Well, are you or aren't you? I don't know nothing about it, I tell you. What are you so nervous about? Well, nothing. I... I just don't know nothing about it. Look, son, maybe you don't know it, but there's a severe penalty for withholding information from the law in this state. If you do know anything about this case, anything at all, it's your duty to tell the ranger and me now. Well, I... Yeah? 
Well, there's a pretty bad turn over there on Pine Creek. Mr. Hutton might have had an accident when nobody was around. See, that is a possibility, Ranger. That's the worst stretch along the road. And one of those turns is a bad one. Nah, old Bob Hutton could drive that road backwards and blindfolded. He's been doing it for years. Besides me and the kid come in by the road last night. There wasn't no wreck along at 10. Did you see anything, son? No. No, there, there wasn't nothing along the road when we went by. We came out that way this morning, Jace. Wasn't anything inside then, either. Well, the area along the creek is uh, an old cutover. Brush has come back thick in spots. The car down in there could be completely hidden from the road. Well, we're going to have to search every inch of the way out in town to eliminate accident as a possibility in this case anyway, Jace. This bad turn out by the creek sounds like as good a place as any to begin with. Yeah, let's get out there and take a look. Uh, you mind showing us that cutover, Mr. Browning? Well, not at all, Ranger. I'll get my car and you can follow me. Uh, Bull, if anything comes up here while I'm going, you take care of it for me, will you? Oh, sure, boss, sure. I'll take care of everything. Hey, hey. Don't you want me to go with you? No, thanks, son. You better stay here. Yeah, kid, you stay here. There's going to be plenty to keep you busy. <laughs> Roadside tracks and broken brush near the bad turn on Pine Creek were so faint we nearly missed them. The car itself was completely screened from the road by brush. It was badly burned and lay upside down on an open patch of grass. The body of its driver slumped near the wheel. It's an accident, all right, Jace. Seems like. Good heavens. What a way to die. Marks indicate Hutton lost control when he left the road. Judging from the damage to the car, I think there's no question but what he was dead when the wreck caught fire. Well, I hope so. I told you I couldn't believe Bob Hutton would steal that money. Looks like you were right, Mr. Browning. Here, look in this window. Yeah. What a mess. There's your money. What's left of it? There beside the springs of that burned seat cushion. Oh, yeah. I see some corn rolls with the wrappers burned off. And that fluff of ash on top of them is what's left of the paper money. It's hard to believe it would burn that much. It was a mighty hot fire while it lasted. Even the body metals warped all out of shape. Well, Jace, looks like it's back to town for us. I got to get an undertaker's wagon out here to pick up his body. Yeah, I'll have to kill that all points wanted bulletin on Hutton, too. Guess that'll about wind this up, huh? I'm not so sure, Sheriff. What do you mean? Well, this, this just doesn't feel quite right. What doesn't? Finding this car like this. We might have looked for a day before we found it down here in this brush. Don't you have more to go on than that, Ranger? No, nope, nothing more. Just a hunch. Seems like working on hunches would be kind of dangerous in your business. It usually is for somebody. Come on, I, I want to get back to the mill. Well, what do you want to go back there for? You don't need a phone. You can use your car radio. Yeah, I know. But there's something funny about this. I want to get it cleared up. Hey, Sheriff, look out. Hmm? Watch where you're stepping. What is he? That matchbox. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. What's so important about a matchbox? It could be plenty important. Now look where it's lying. I don't get you, Jace. All right, look up there, Sheriff. That's where Hutton's car turned over. It slid down from there on its roof. The matchbox is right in the track, and it hasn't been crushed. Hmm. Meaning it was dropped after the wreck. What? That's right, Sheriff. Let's see. It's empty. The last match was used and the box thrown away. Well, used for what, Ranger? What's a matchbox got to do with Bob Hutton's death? Maybe nothing. But even when a car is as badly damaged as this one was, even when it's drenched with gasoline, it doesn't always catch fire. Let's go back a minute. Do you know what you're saying? I think so. You mean somebody could have deliberately set this car fire after the accident? If this was an accident. Oh, but look, Jace, the only possible reason for arson in a case like this would be to cover taking the money Hutton had with him. And it's still there. What's left of it, anyway. I know, Sheriff. There we are. Give me a hand, will you, Sheriff? Sure, Jace. What do you want to do? And see if we can't get what's left of that money out without disturbing the ash around it. I want to send it into the lab. What'll that get you? If any of it's missing, they may be able to tell us. We removed the remains of the charred money bag and its contents as carefully as possible and packed them for transfer to the laboratory. When we drove back to the mill yard, Bull Evans was just coming out of the office. Hi. You find any sign of Hutton? Yes. He's dead, Bull. Dead? He had an accident near Pine Creek. Just about where that kid suggested we look, too. Well, can you beat that? 
Where is the kid? I think we'd better talk to him again. Well, you ain't gonna get much out of him, Ranger. Why? No, these young punks never look where they're going or what they're doing. He's got himself really bunged up. Where is he? In the first aid room back at the office. I wanted to send for a doctor, but he wouldn't let me. I got him on a cot back there. He don't feel so good. Let's take a look. Come on. You too, Bull. Yeah, sure. Right through there, Ranger. Okay. Easy, kid. Let's have a look at him. No. Leave me be. Why, his face is beat to a pulp. Bruises on his ribs and belly, too. What happened to you, son? No. Go away. You better answer the ranger, boy. What happened to you? Go on, kid. Tell him what happened. The drying rack. It fell on me. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Logger's Larceny, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The kid was in no condition for further questioning. When we were unable to persuade him to submit to medical treatment, the sheriff and I returned to town and had a talk with the justice of the peace. The next morning, the sheriff attended Hutton's inquest while I waited in his office for a call from our lab at Austin. It had just come through when the sheriff returned. Sorry to be so long, Jase. I was comfortable, Sheriff. You got a nice office. (laughs) Thanks. Inquest over? Yeah. Death by natural causes, I suppose. Yeah, failure of the heart. Doc says Hutton was dead when his car left the road. An out-and-out accident. Oh, look, Jase, it's like the J.P. told you last night. That matchbox don't mean anything. It could have blown in on those tracks. I guess this isn't my week for hunches, Sheriff. Now the lab report came in, too. How did it add up? Coins in the bank sack tallied exactly with the withdrawal slip the teller gave us. Oh, how about the bills, the paper money? There were traces of them in the ash. The quantity was small and might indicate some paper money was missing, but it burned so completely the lab couldn't be sure. Yeah, looks like that's that. Yeah. Well, Sheriff, guess I better get started. So long, Jason. Thanks. See you again on another case. Yeah. Call us any time you need us. You know, Sheriff, it still doesn't feel right. You know, Jace, it doesn't to me either. There's that matchbox. Sure, it could have blown in there, but that kid at the mill. Yeah? What about the kid? If he had a hunch Hutton's car was wrecked and where it might be, why didn't he tell his boss that as soon as he and Bull came in from the timber? Yeah, that's right. As it was, he didn't tell us till we dragged it out of it. That turn out there didn't have anything to do with Hutton's death. His heart quit. He could have gone over the edge anywhere along the road. Yeah, but, Jace, he did go over at that turn. Sure he did. And that's why the kid couldn't have known the car was there unless he'd seen it. Then Bull Evans and the kid were lying. But why? That's what we're going to find out. That and why the drying rack fell on the kid. Kind of funny two accidents should happen so close together. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get out to that mill. For you and Ranger Pearson back. Something new come up? Not exactly, Mr. Browning. Just a few loose ends. I want to talk to that kid who was hurt yesterday. How is he? Oh, apparently a lot better than he looks. How's that? He was up for breakfast this morning. Insisted he was in shape to work. In shape to work? Mm, that's what he claimed. That kid was in shape for a hospital. Oh, Bull banked him up. He'd been taking care of him. I guess he ought to know. They around the yard here? Well, Bull didn't figure the kid was quite up to yard work. They went out with a felon crew. Together? Sure. Uh, Bull said he'd watch after the kid. Oh, he did, huh? Where are they? Uh, up in the northeast quarter of Section 3 someplace, about four miles out. Come on, Sheriff. We'd better get out there. That kid was in no condition to work. Well, you can't make it in a car. We haven't got our access road to that section finished yet. You got any horses here? Yeah. The one I use for making my rounds of the crews is saddled up out back. Bring it around for the Sheriff. I'll get my horse unloaded from the trailer. All right away, Ranger. Come on, Sheriff. Get on the other side of that end gate, will you? Sure. You think that kid's in any danger, Chase? What do you think? I'm beginning to think so. So am I. Oh, back out, Sparky. Steady, boy. Easy, easy, boy. Uh, here you are, Sheriff. 
Sheriff's ought to be about right. Now, thanks, Mr. Browning. Now, you take that work road at the corner of the yard. You begin to hit some of the crew out at the end of it. They can tell you just where Bull and his helper is. Thanks. Let's go, Sheriff. Up, Char. Come on, pick him up, boys. Ah! Following Mr. Browning's directions, we found some of his sawyers and axemen at work in deep woods. They sent us on to others, knowing only that Bull Evans and the kid were working somewhere up ahead. Hold it, Sheriff. Oh, 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 Char. Listen. Somebody working over there. Yeah, come on. Let's go, Charlie. Yeah, come on, boy. Is it Bull and the kid? No. Who? Who, Charco? Hey there. Hi. Uh, howdy, Sheriff. Ranger. What you doing out here? Looking for Bull Evans and his partner. Boys down the line said they were up this way. Yeah, they were a little while ago. Where'd they go? Blame to find no. To a crazy. Crazy? What do you mean? Well, that bull was working over there. You can see the cut he was making. Uh-huh. The kid wasn't worth much, bunged up the way he was, so he was just fooling around, kind of grubbing out a little brush. Well, that bull come over to bum a smoke off of me, and when he turned around, the kid was gone. Gone? Yeah. Slipped off in the brush. Bull hollered for him. When he didn't get no answer, bull took right off after him, swearing fit to make old Paul Bunyan turn over in his grave. How long ago? Ooh, 10, maybe 15 minutes ago. Come on, Sheriff. Hey, look, what is all this? Tell you later, son. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Here's the tracks again on this soft ground. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, charcoal. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Steady, boy. What do you make of it, Jace? I don't like it. Where do you suppose that kid's heading? Yeah, beats me. Wherever it is, he's sure heading there in a straight line and hard as he can go. Yeah, with Bull apparently right behind him. Makes about as little sense as that drying rack falling on him yesterday or Bull talking him into reporting for work this morning. What's between the two of them? That's what we got to find out. Tracking us too slow. We're losing too much time. That's pretty thick timber ahead. Get out of slow them up some. Won't be much to follow when we get in there in those pine needles either. Uh, Jace, maybe we better split, sort of spread out. That way we'll be... Hey, hear that? Somebody in there's got a gun. Come on. Get up, charcoal. Come on. Get up. You know, I'm betting it's full. Sounds like the shots are in the middle of that timber stand. It's a bad place to work blind, Jace. Yeah. You might miss them complete in there. Possible. Look, Sheriff. You cut around the timber the other edge in case somebody breaks out in the clear in that direction. I'll head straight for the sound of those shots. Try to box them in, huh? Worth a try. Come on, Charlie. Come on, Timber Horse. Let's go. Deep into the timber, I stopped near a blowdown. A huge living pine tree blown over onto the ground. I wanted to listen for movement. But I knew an armed man was somewhere ahead of me, and charcoal seemed to sense my tenseness. Whoa, Charco. Steady, boy. Steady. Take it easy, Charky. Confound it. What are you shying away from? Whoa, whoa, boy. All right. Crawl out from under that blowdown. No. No. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Nobody's going to shoot, kid. Crawl out of there. No, get away, will you? Leave me be. He'll kill me if he finds me. Get hold of yourself, kid. Who'll kill you? What for? Bull. He almost caught me. You're all right now, son. Come on out. He shot at me. I crawled in there and he lost me. He ran on past. I heard him. But he'll be back. You better tell me why he's after you. Come on, spill it quick. Oh. I saw him take the money. From Hutton's wreck car? Yeah. Yeah, we came down to the creek and there it was. He took the money and threw a match into the gasoline. He burned the car. Mr. Hutton's still in it. Oh, settle down. Take it easy. Hutton was dead when his car left the road. Why didn't you tell us about this yesterday when we asked well, you? Well, I, I tried to tell you, but Boo was standing there watching, listening. And look what happened to me afterwards. That accident at the drying rack? The accident. He pushed the rack over to make it look that way. Afterwards, he beat me and almost killed me. Came close enough. Why didn't you sneak out to Mr. Browning with your story last night? Well, I never got a chance. Boo got a gun out of his passports bag and kept it under his blanket all night, pointed at me. He never slept a wink. I had to get up this morning and make it look like I, I wanted to come out here to work with him. Why'd you head in this direction when you made your break this morning? Well, I figured if I could get to the money and get it back to Mr. Browning, this would all be over. And, well, then I'd be safe. You know where the money is? Yeah, yeah, it's an old stump in a draw 
between here and the road. Come on. Charcoal will carry double. We got some riding to do. I could understand the kid's terror. A professional criminal knows the odds against him and seldom goes beyond a certain limit. An amateur is like a man in quicksand, more desperate with every step and more dangerous. There. there that's the stump right over there. Oh, Charlie. Oh, boy. There's a hollow on the other side of it. Now, hurry up, will you? Uh-huh. Take it easy, kid. Charcoal made a lot better time than Bull could have made on foot. Besides, he's still probably looking for you. Well, maybe he's been here already. We'll soon see. Yeah, it's here, all right. Can't you hurry? Hey, this is a pile of money. Yeah, I know. Come on. All set, kid. Just as soon as I stash these bills away in my saddlebags, this is what you call valuable evidence. And this is what's called a gun, Ranger. Bull! Praise for the earth. You're making a mistake, Bull. You've made yours. Drop them saddlebags. You ain't getting that money. It's mine. Now drop them. All right, get off that horse, kid. Get off, I said. All right. Now start backing away from my money. Both of you. I told you I'd kill you if you opened your mouth, kid. Now it's going to be both of you. You, You hurt, kid? No. No, are you okay? Yeah. Bull's gun just didn't shoot very straight. Oh, you sure didn't, and fast. That's what a spring clip holster's for, son. Jace! Jace! Oh, ho, 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 ho! Everything all right? Yeah, for everybody but Bull. He... he's dead? Kind of. What was the deal, Jace? Did he have some of the money from the wreck? Show him what's in the saddlebags, kid. All right. Hey, Sheriff, take a look. Hmm. Looks like he had it all. How deep was the kid here in with him? I reckon that's something the court will have to judge on the evidence. Here, give me a hand, Sheriff. We'll hang Bull across your saddle. He's got one last ride coming. On November 12th, 1938, the kid was arraigned before the county court and found innocent of willful complicity in the theft from the paymaster's wrecked car. He was returned to society with a deeper appreciation and understanding of the duties of a citizen in the face of crime. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. You know, we're awfully grateful to you people for the nice letters you've sent in. It makes you feel good to know that there are some folks who just want to let you know that they're all for you and that they like your show. I know it's kind of an effort to sit down and write a letter or postcard to a voice hundreds of miles away, and that's why it would be downright ungrateful if we didn't thank you for your trouble. It's really a compliment. There's a little story I ran across about a ranger I thought you'd like to hear before we say goodnight. I thought it was kind of funny. It seems that in the days when the Texas Rangers were charged with the enforcement of the Prohibition laws, their reputation for apprehending offenders caused moonshiners to keep a sharp eye out for these famed officers. One day on a lonely road in East Texas, a moonshiner with a load of bootleg whiskey rounded a turn and came upon a man dressed in khaki clothes, big hat, and boots, signaling him to stop. Frantically, he grabbed a wrench and broke all ten of the one-gallon bottles of whiskey. Turning to the man on the road, he called... You can't arrest me, Ranger. You ain't got no evidence. What do you mean, fellow? Replied the Texas Ranger. I have a flat tire. Can you loan me your jack? Good night, folks. See you again next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Ray is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Conrad, Stacey Harris, Parley Bear, and Bill Johnstone. This story was transcribed and adapted by Tom W. Blackburn, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday is for music, the best in music on NBC. 
Tomorrow evening, the telephone hour brings you contralto Marion Anderson as guest soloist. And for a melodic blend of light classical and classical music, you're invited to the second concert in a new Monday evening series by the Boston Pops under the baton of Arthur Fiedler. Now, Jack Parr with the $64 question for more good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The Hatchet. It is 8.30 a.m. Sunday, May 16th, 1941. The Halleck family of Rock Point, Texas, is preparing to leave for church. You want any more toast, Jim? Nope. All I want is another cup of coffee. I'll get it myself. Why don't you sit down and eat? Well, I would if I could get that boy to the table. Robert? Robert! I'm coming, Ma. You've been saying that for half an hour. Your eggs are getting cold and we'll be late for church. All right, all right. And never mind that all right business. When your mother called you, you just come a running. Gee whiz, Pa, I gotta wash my face, don't I? I'll be right there. Well, see the jar, you'll go without your breakfast. Now, you come sit down, Hattie. No need of your stomach being empty. Just coffee will do for me. Seems like the older a boy gets, the harder it is to get him out of bed in the morning. What time did he get in last night? After 11. Him and Sadie Lewis went to the picture show. I told him I wanted him home at 10 o'clock nights. Oh, Jim, it was Saturday night. He goes to school all week. Well, school will soon be over. He'll be working with me in the store all summer. Maybe he won't feel much like staying out half the night when he's been on his feet all day. Look at the time. Robert! I'm here, Pa. I'm here. Well, it's about time. I'll get your breakfast, but the eggs will be like rubber. I don't want anything to eat. I'm not hungry. Well, why didn't you say so before your ma wasted her time and the food? You gotta eat something. I'll have breakfast when we get back from church. Sure, that'll be fine. You can make more work for your ma that way. Gee, Pa, I just don't feel hungry now. Oh, leave him alone, Jim. I'll get him something later. I just put the dishes in to soak. You two want to get out of my way? Why don't you go next door and tell Mr. Driscoll we're about ready to leave? Uh, is he riding with us again? Yes, he's riding with us again, so stop sulking about it. Come on. You ought to be glad to have your teacher for a neighbor. You wouldn't be at the head of your graduating class if it weren't for his helping you. I see enough of him in school without seeing him Sunday, too. Yeah. Well, when you get away to college in the fall, you might be wishing you had somebody like him close by to give you a hand. Ring the bell. He don't answer. Maybe he went on. He'd have told us. And I didn't hear his car. Come on, maybe he's out in the back. Mr. Driscoll! That's funny. Run up the back steps and take a look in the kitchen window. Oh, why don't we just go without him? Will you do like I tell you? Okay. See anything? No, he didn't. Pa! Pa! What is it, son? What's the matter? Look at him. Lying there on the floor. Oh. Pa, what is it? What happened to him? Come away, son. Don't look anymore. Come away. I gotta call the sheriff. It it looks like he's been murdered. Shh. 
Sheriff Alvin Jeffers took one look at the scene of the crime and put in a call for the assistance of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Uh, mighty bloody job, Jace. No weapon in sight. Nope. Judging by the marks, though, it was something with two edges, one blunt and one sharp. Probably a hatchet, Sheriff. Either that or two weapons. Mm, it's possible, but not likely. You say the J.P.'s been here? Mm-hmm. As soon as we're finished, the body will be moved into the funeral home for autopsy. Established time of death. That'll help. Where'd your call come from? Neighbors next door, the Halleck's. Man, wife, and son. Man and boy spotted Driscoll through the window when they come to get him for a lift to church. I'd like to talk to him. Sure, I told him to stick to home. Oh, we can go out back and hop the fence. Avoid that crowd out front. Good. Yeah, front room looked like Driscoll went in big for books. Yeah, he was an English teacher at the high school. Alec boy Robert was in one of his classes, I think. Driscoll live alone? Mm-hmm. A widower. Here, step on this box and hop the fence. Yeah, you go ahead. I can get over without it. Okay. <laughs> Well, Halleck saw us coming. There he is at the back door. Uh, howdy, Kerr. Ranger. Come on in. Thanks. Ranger Pearson, Jim Halleck. Howdy, howdy. Oh, uh, my wife, Hattie, and my boy, Robert. Uh, howdy. Howdy, Ranger. Uh, you found Driscoll's body this morning? Me and Robert. Saw it through the window. What time? Oh, about quarter to nine. That's when we always leave for services. Oh, Jace, I ought to call my office. Have the funeral home come for the body now. All right, go ahead. Yeah, mind if I use your phone, Halleck? Help yourself. I'll show you where it is, sir. Oh, you'd better stay, Robert. Okay. You and your dad found the body. Would you mind, Mrs. Halleck? Not at all. In here, sir. Thank you. Either of you see Driscoll yesterday or last night? We both saw him outside last night, a little after six. I was coming home from the store. I sell groceries. Robert was outside waiting for me so as he could take the car. Big date, huh? <laughs> yeah. What was Driscoll doing? Digging a flower border on his lawn. You talked to him? Just called to him after Robert took the car and drove off. Asked if he planned on riding to church with us. No sense taking two cars when neighbors are going to the same place. I see. Isn't that all? That's all. You didn't hear anything during the evening or the night? Nope. Me and Hattie turned in a little after nine. How about you, Robert? What time did you get home? Um, what time did you get home? You can tell him. I know you was late. Your mother heard you come in. A little after 11. Where were you? To a picture show with Sadie Lewis. What did you see? I, I don't remember the name of it. Bing Crosby's in it. Jase, you going to be much longer? Oh, no, Sheriff. Why? I spoke to my office. One of my deputies got a report. Rancher named Finney chased somebody off his place with a shotgun last night. Doorbell, Hattie. I'm going. Uh, did the deputy think the report might have anything to do with the Driscoll's murder? Well, who knows? The fellow Finney saw was doing something around a cattle tank, though. Yeah, good place to get rid of a weapon. Cattle tanks have been used before. Well, maybe we ought to go out and take a look. Yeah. Robert? It's Gene to see you. Hi, Bob. Hi. Hi, Mr. Halleck, Sheriff. Hello, Gene. Yeah, I just drove in to see if Bob wanted to go out to the shack and camp, and I saw that crowd in front of next door. Somebody killed old man Driscoll, huh? Yeah, I can't go with you today. Well, yeah, guess not. Are you helping the sheriff, Ranger? We're helping each other. Well, boy, I sure hope you catch that guy. Mr. Driscoll was the best teacher we ever had. Uh, we'll try to square things for him, Gene. Come on, Jace. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your help. We may want to talk to you again later. Uh, you're sure welcome, Ranger. Bye. Bye, ma'am. So long, folks. Bye. Bye. So long, Bye. Ranger. Who was that kid, the one who just came in? You mean Gene? No, her name's Gene McCready. Pal of Roberts. They go to school together. Why? Just wondering. Robert Halleck ever give any of you any trouble around here? Yeah, we'll take my car. No, he's a good kid. Why? I just got a feeling he was covering up for something, that's all. Like what? If I knew that, I wouldn't be wondering about it. How far to Finney's place? Turn off to the right about six miles out. Just this side of the Lewis place. The Lewis place? Well, Robert Halleck says that he was out at a movie last night with a girl named Sadie Lewis. Yeah, she lives out there. Mike Lewis' daughter. Only 15, but a big girl for her age. <laughs> Lewis watches her like a hawk. I'd like to stop by the Lewis place and talk to that girl. Okay, we can go out there after we check at Finney's. Well, 
Well, right here's about where he was when I spotted him. I called, but he started to run. I threw a load of buckshot after him. You didn't see who it was? No, I didn't. It was too far off, about 300 feet back to the house. What time was that, Penny? Oh, just for 11 o'clock last night. Wasn't that kind of late for you to be out here? Well, I'd been visiting. I was cutting across the ranch walking home. From where? Mike Lewis's place. We get together Saturday nights, play cards. Oh, no, no, not for money, just passing time. You always carry a shotgun when you're passing time? Well, matter of fact, I do. Bag a jackrabbit once in a while, going, coming between here and Mike's place. So I always throw the gun just in case. I see. <laughs> I see better than you do, Jace. I've eaten out here. Mrs. Finney can do more things with a jackrabbit in a pot than most women can do with a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was just checking. Now about the fellow you saw. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, when he didn't answer my call, I fluffed him with a shot. Don't think I hit him, no. A little too far. Barely saw him as it was. Uh, which way did he take off? Well, oh, that way. Highway's about a mile across country there. You chase him? Yep, sure did. But I reckon he was a lot younger than me. Well, what makes you say that? Well, after two minutes of running, I was puffing like an engine in a tunnel. He was pulling away with every jump. Is there anything around here he might have been trying to steal? No, not a thing. Unless he was trying to make off with a cow and... There'd be nothing to try on foot. Well, Sheriff, guess we'd better chuck our boots and hop in there. Uh, into my cattle tank. That's right, Finney. But what for? If we're lucky, the weapon that was used in the killing of the high school teacher, Driscoll. The cattle tank was big. The bottom was covered deep with a couple of inches of oozing mud and slime. And we slithered around in it for almost half an hour. Along the bottom, Jace. Yeah, it sure is. I was going to have it cleaned out next month. Looks like we're going to have to save you the trouble and the expense. We'll have to call a pumping crew, Sheriff. Yeah, it looks that way. Hey, give me a hand up, Penny. All right, now, easy. Uh, uh, thanks. Wait over here, Jace, and we'll boost you out. Okay, Sheriff. Now, we're sure going to feel silly if we have this pumped out and there's nothing here. We'll feel sillier if we don't have it done, and there is something here that turns up later. I think we ought to... What's the matter, Jace? Uh, feel something. Here, under my foot. Yeah, I felt it coming over this way, too. Some stones in the mud. No, this is metal. Wait, I'll get it. Ooh. What is it, Jace? Look for yourself, Sheriff. Just about what we're looking for. A hatchet. <laughs> You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Hatchet, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It was the murder weapon, all right. The blood had been washed away from most of it, but there was skin tissue and hair that had stuck to the blood end, and... Well, I reckon that's it, all right, Jace. But who threw it away on my place, and why? Killer wanted to get rid of it in a place he thought nobody would be liable to find it. Must have thought of this spot last night. That means he knew the place. He wouldn't cross the range on foot unless he did. You say he ran off that way? That's right. Like Sheriff said, highway's about a mile. He could have left a car there he was getting back to, or he might have cut off in another direction when you lost him. You have horses here, don't you, Finney? Why, sure, sure, but nothing like the one you're towing in that trailer behind your car. It's really a horse, Ranger. I think so, too. What I want is a mount for the sheriff here. Where do you figure on riding, Jace? Out on the range, see if we can pick up a trail. I'll unload charcoal and start ahead, and you walk back to the ranch house and get one of Finney's horses and catch up to me. <laughs> anything? The track's all right. Not too heavy on this ground, though. They're easy to lose. Yeah, but this is a straight shot from the ridge. Looks like he was sure going for the road, all right. No doubt about it. If he left a car there, we might be able to find some tire marks where he parked. Afraid you're going to be stymied there, Jace. Why? County just worked the roads over. Shoulders are all fresh gravel. Oh? What's the shortest way to the Lewis Ranch? Go back for the car or keep riding? Well, we'd save a little time going back for the car. Not much. Well, charcoal's full of run. Let's give him a chance for a workout. Come on. Get up. Get up. Hey. 
The Lewis Ranch was big and well kept. But there was something dismal and brooding about it. When we got inside, I knew what it was. It was as though the place were reflecting the personality of the heavy-browed man who owned it. So you want to see my daughter, huh? That's right. What about her? Just want to ask her where she was last night? She was into the movie house with Robert Halleck. Yeah, we'd like a little more information than that, Mike. The ranger... I know everything my daughter does. I can tell you anything you want to know. That may be so, Mr. Lewis, but we still want to see her. That's an official request. I'll call her. Sadie! Yes, Paul? Come into the house. Yes, Paul? Into the parlor. know anybody was here. Sheriff and the ranger want to talk to you. They don't think you and Robert was at the show last night. Nobody said that. You don't have to say it. Look, if you can't keep out of this, you can take your mind reading act into another room until we're finished. It'd be better if you didn't interfere, Mike. Go ahead, ask. Maybe I'll be interested in the answers, too. Sadie, don't be nervous. Just tell the truth. Were you with Robert Halleck last night? Yes. Where'd you go? We went... Where did you go? To the movie. Remember the name of the picture? The new one with with Bing Crosby. You saw that with me a month ago when I took you to Sweetwater. I saw it again. There's no other show to see in town. Is there... Robert brought you the ticket stubs, didn't he, Pa? Brought you the ticket stubs? That's right, Ranger. Brought me the stubs. My daughter's supposed to be someplace. I want to make sure she's there. I'm not gambling on being fed any lies. No, I can see that. You're not gambling that your girl might tell you the truth either, given the chance. Reckon the law's got nothing to say about that. I reckon not. Let me have that package, Sheriff. Yeah, here. What's in it? Just something I want you to look at. Hatchet. Yeah. You ever see this before? No. How about you, Sadie? You ever see this before? No, sir, I never. Why are you asking us about it? Just routine. This is the weapon used to kill Driscoll, the high school teacher. <gasps> All right, Sheriff. Wrap it up again. Let's go. Sorry to have bothered you, Mr. Lewis. Yeah. You ready, Sheriff? Yeah. Goodbye, Mike. Sadie. Bye. Bye. Sadie, you've been lying to me. Answer me! (laughs) Looks like Sadie's in for a rough time, Jace. She wasn't telling the truth. He knows it. Her story ties in with Robert Halleck's, Jace. I know. It'll be dark by the time we get back to Finney's place. Movie house open tonight? Sure. Why? I want to talk to the manager. The theater was a small town show place. The manager couldn't remember seeing Robert Halleck and Sadie Lewis. He referred us to the ticket taker. The ticket taker turned out to be Robert Halleck's pal, Gene McCready. Come on, Gene. Talk up. Was Robert here for the show last night or wasn't he? What? Uh... I I don't know. He's your best friend, and you were on the door last night. If he came in, you saw him. Yeah, he was here. Did he stay for the whole show? No. No, he didn't stay for any of it. How do you know? Did you see him leave before it was over? Well, he, uh, he didn't even go in. He he just stopped by to get a couple of ticket stubs from me. So that's it. Why didn't you tell us that right off? Because I, I promised Bob that a... If anybody asked, I'd say him and Sadie was here. Well, why would anybody ask? Bob thought Sadie's father might. He's asked me before when they were supposed to be here. Well, I guess that's what we wanted, Jace. Yeah, it's part of it, not all of it. Gene, I want you to forget that I asked you anything, understand? Yes, sir. Let's go, Sheriff. I guess we better pick up Robert Halleck and the Lewis girl, Jace. Not yet. All we know is they didn't see the show. That isn't enough. Don't see why not. This wasn't just a transient thing. Driscoll didn't have no enemies, unless it was one of his pupils hated him. We can narrow it down to one student, though. Not until we've checked on all of them. I'm going to sleep on this tonight. When school opens tomorrow, I'm going out there. Driscoll had been a popular teacher at Rock Point High. But he had an iron-bound code of ethics where honesty was concerned. And that was the key I needed. I found the answer in a batch of test papers he'd been grading. I took the papers back to the sheriff's office. Morning, Jace. Morning. Find anything out the school? Plenty. Look at these. Mm, What are they? English class test papers of Robert Halleck and Gene McCready. Uh, Let's see. Halleck's mark's pretty high. 94. Yeah. 
Hey, only half the answers on McGrady's paper have been checked. His isn't graded. Compare them and you'll see why. His answer to every single question is exactly the same as Halleck's, all the way down the line. Driscoll must have noticed it while he was marking. Hmm. You think McGrady was cribbing his answers from Bob Halleck's paper? Halleck was at the head of the class. McGrady was just barely hanging on. Those papers were clipped together in the drawer of Driscoll's desk with this slip of paper. A few notes scribbled on it in Driscoll's handwriting. Here, read what it says. Hmm. An obvious case of cheating. Flunk McCready. If Halleck knew of this, advise principal neither should be permitted to graduate. Well. Test was on Friday. Driscoll must have been grading those papers after school let out. Halleck came home, but Gene McCready was sitting out of punishment in another class for being late. That means Driscoll might have run into Gene Friday afternoon and asked him about it. That's what I figured. Of course, Gene could have told Bob later. Yeah, he could have. Robert Halleck's the boy, all right, Jase. He lied about where he was Saturday night, and Gene was working at the theater. Maybe yes, maybe no. You get the autopsy report yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Came in this morning. What time did Driscoll die? Uh, between uh, 9.30 and 10.30 Saturday night. Then we can't eliminate Gene McCready. Why not? He starts taking theater tickets at 6.30, but the box office closes at 9 when the main feature goes on again. He's got nothing to do after that. His work's finished. Well, I didn't think of that. You better give me the hatchet, Sheriff. I'll need it. Sure. Got it locked in the drawer here. What's your plan? You go out to the school, get Bob Halleck, and bring him to his father's store. I'll meet you there. Would you want Gene McCready, too? He's not in school. He's supposed to be home sick. We can pick him up later. I don't want him and Robert together. Ranger, you're crazy. Crazy, I tell you. Now, calm down, Mr. Halleck. You admit the hatchet comes from your place. No. A minute ago, you said it did. Well, it disappeared months ago. It was lost. It got lost again in a cattle tank. Where's your car? Out back. Through that door. All right, let's look it over. Your son was using this car Saturday night. Yes. Why? What are you looking for? Hatchet had to be carted away from Driscoll's and there was blood on it. I'm looking for a stain. Well, you don't see any, do you? No, but I see a spot on the front seat that's cleaner than the rest. You smell that? It's been rubbed with gasoline. Ranger, you're wrong. You gotta be wrong. My kid wouldn't do a thing like that. Out here, Robert. Here we are, Chase. Pa, what's the matter? Why did they take me out of school? Son, son, whatever you've done, me and your mall stand by you. Now, tell him the truth. You were at the show Saturday. Tell him you were. How about it, Robert? Gene said you just dropped by to pick up ticket stubs. I... I wasn't at the show. Why didn't you tell me? Why? I couldn't. Because of Sadie's father. He'd kill her. You better tell us what happened, boy. Why? I picked up Sadie in the car at 6.30... We went into the movie house to leave the car with Gene and get the stubs. You left the car with Gene? Yes. So it'd be around the theater in case Sadie's pa came by. Well, then what happened? Then we arranged for Gene to meet us out at the crossroads between the Lewis Place and Finney's at 11 o'clock. So I'd have the car to take Sadie home. See? See, Ranger? He didn't have the car all the time. Uh, Go ahead, Robert. Where did you and Sadie go? We, We went for a ride with... Somebody who picked us up behind the theater. What do you mean by somebody? Who? Sadie's mother. What? Why, Sadie Lewis's mother is dead. No, she isn't. That's what Mr. Lewis tells everybody. They were divorced before he moved here with Sadie. Could that be true, Sheriff? Well, Jace, I don't know. Mike Lewis always said his wife died. She didn't. He just hated her, that's all. And Well, if he finds out Sadie's been seeing her, he'll beat her up. All right, Robert. I think you're telling the truth. There's something I want you to identify. This. Why, that's our old kindling hatchet. Where'd you see it last? Well, the shack. Me and Gene built a shack up in the woods last fall. We go camping up there. I built most of it because Gene, he was working part-time after school at Finney's Ranch. That's right, Jace. Gene did work for Finney for a while. Come on, Sheriff. We'd better go pick him up. <laughs>
Gene McCready wasn't at his home, and he wasn't sick. We got the location of the shack he built with Robert Halleck, got horses, and rode into the woods to look for him. There's the shack, Jase, just through that clump of trees. Yeah. Come on, Sharky. Hey, the door's opening. It's Gene. Howdy, Gene. What are you doing up here? Just come up to take you into town, Gene. A few things we want to ask you about. Well, like what? Like how you spent Saturday evening between the time you stopped taking tickets and the time you met Robert at the crossroad between the Lewis place and Finney's. Come on, Gene. I'll boost you up behind me. Well, can I... Can I get my jacket? It's inside. Go ahead. Hey, he don't look guilty, Jace. Not a bit rattled. I know. Well, we could be wrong, but you better give me your holster, Sheriff, if he's gonna ride behind you. Yeah, I guess you're... Look out, Jace! <laughs> You hit, Sheriff? No, but I hit him. <laughs> he had a rifle in there. Kept out shooting just as you leaned over. Oh, you hit me. Yeah. Let's see. There's a flesh wound through the side. I didn't want to hurt him, but Mr. Driscoll wasn't going to let me graduate, the old fool. All right, shut up. And hold still till I fix this wound. Will he be all right, Jace? Yeah. I'm sorry I had to do that, shooting a kid. Yeah, but... His being a kid doesn't make you bulletproof. And it didn't stop him from killing Driscoll. There. All right, Sheriff. Let's rig a litter and carry him in. Gene McCready was just old enough to stand formal trial for the murder of his high school instructor. On September 20th, 1941, he was taken to the state penitentiary at Huntsville to serve out a sentence of 25 years. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. There's a poem that was sent to me by Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, who's commander of Company B of the Texas Rangers. It's not only amusing, but seems to reflect the thoughts of many a police officer. I hope you'll enjoy hearing it. It's called Not Guilty. I guess I've seen a thousand men go in this jail and out, from tramps with month-old whiskers to rich men with a gout. Not one of them was guilty of the crimes the law accused. Seems they were all just victims of some officer's abuse. From the time the keys are rattled till they're locked up in the cell, their voices, though they differ from a whisper to a yell, the song is always just the same that everyone will sing. I don't see why they put me here. I haven't done a thing. Makes no difference what they've done or how mean the crime has been. When they're locked behind those prison bars, they're always free from sin. Though the evidence be solid and their voice with guilt may ring, they'll stand right up and tell you, I haven't done a thing. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Parley Bear, Mike Barrett, Sam Edwards, Joe Duval, Tom Cook, and Gerald Moore. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music, fun, and prizes Monday through Friday on NBC to help your busy morning along. Tommy Bartlett brings you Welcome Travelers. Walter O'Keefe MCs Double or Nothing. Clever quiz master Bud Collier asks the questions on Break the Bank. Jack Birch presents songs and stories. And Dave Garraway with Melody and Humor. That's Monday through Friday on NBC. Now hear the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Casting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the 
Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Sweet Revenge. It is 6.30 p.m. March 13, 1944, at the ranch house of Judd Wilkins. It is raining heavily as Judd and Alva Briggs from a neighboring ranch finish their dinner. Yeah, rain sure coming down, Judd. Yep. You're welcome to stay the night here if you want to, Alva. Oh, no, no, no thanks. I gotta get back to my own place tonight. Told the kid who's been doing my chores over there for the last three days I'd meet him in the morning to pay him. I sure appreciate you helping me and Billings vaccinate the cattle. I'm planning on doing the same for you at your place when you're ready. I'll be ready in a couple of days, I reckon. Hey, a wind must have blown open the door. Hello, Judd. Blake. Yeah. Hello, Alva. Yeah. Well, you don't seem none too happy to see me either, Judd. Well, no, it's just a... That's a big surprise you popping up this way after two years, boy. Of course, I'm glad to see you. You're my brother, ain't you? Oh, yeah, Alva. Where's Kelly? What? You heard me, Blake. Where's my daughter? Well, didn't you hear? Hear yeah, what? Kelly and me. We split up, Alva. Split up? Yeah, in Dallas. I thought you knew. You, you get her to run away with you, and then when you're through with her, you toss her to one side. No, Alva, no. That, that ain't true. That ain't the way of it. Why, you... you... Alva, let go of me. You, I, cut it out. Alva, cut it out. Take your hands off, Blake. Stop me now. Blake Wilkins, if you wasn't your pa's boy... Alva, you've got to listen to me. Just just stay away from me from now on, Blake. Stay away or I'll... I... Judd? Yeah? How come Alva didn't know about Callie and me? Well, you see, Blake... I can understand Callie not wanting to write Alva about it, but I wrote here to Pa right after we split up. I told him the whole story in that letter. Callie was just using me to get away from home. She, she left me as soon as she found somebody else who could do her more good. I told all that in my letter to Pa. He and Alva was friends and neighbors. Now, how come Alva didn't know? Pa died last month, Blake. Yeah, I know. That's why I come home, Judd. I ran into a fellow in Lubbock the other day who told me. But Pa wasn't dead when I wrote that letter. I told him I was sorry about everything, that I wanted to come back home if he wanted me to. But I never heard from him, Judd. Why not? Blake, you're making me say something I don't want to say. Even though you and I are only half-brothers, I've always felt towards you like What a... are you getting at, Judd? Well, hearing about you and Callie splitting up just now makes me feel pretty bad. It was part my fault. You mean because you encouraged me to run away with her? Yeah. You come to me asking advice. I told you on the QT I figured you had a right to your own life, but I sure didn't know it was going to turn Pa against you like you did. Turn him against me? Judd, I want to know what happened to that letter that I wrote Pa. All right, Blake. Pa wouldn't even open your letter. Just threw it away. He what? Said he never wanted to see you or hear from you again. Well, Judd, that just doesn't sound like Pa. He just wouldn't say a thing like that about me. I know, boy. It's hard to believe. You and he always used to be so close. Of course, you was his own son. I wasn't, so it was natural for things to Judd, be that way. Judd, are you way, sure but... that Pa got my letter? Why, of course. I just told you, Blake. All right. All right. What did Pa say in his will? Well, now... Everything's taken care of, Blake. I want to know how it's taken care of, Judd. Uh, Will's in town. and go in as soon as we can. I'll show it to you. You got a pleasant surprise coming, kid. You know, it's sure going to be good having you home. You come at a good time, too. We need another hand here, and I'm not sure Al will ever be back to help after tonight. But having you back again, everything's going to be fine from now on. I'm not so sure. What do you mean? Al, for the way he feels about me. I don't like things like that. Oh, well, don't you worry about Alvin on Blake. You get over it. You know, I think I'll take a horse and ride across to Alvin's place. Tonight? Yeah. See if I can get things straightened out with him. Afterwards, I could stay on the shack the rest of the night. It's about halfway. That way, I'd be out there to lend you a hand in the morning. Is there bedding and food out the shack? Yeah, yeah. Plenty of it. 
Okay, Blake, if you want to go. But if Albert don't listen to reason, don't you argue with him. And don't be afraid of him. He won't harm you as long as I'm alive and kicking. Yes, sir, Blake. I'll take care of you from now on. The next morning, Tom Billings, a ranch hand, rode out to the isolated shack on the Wilkins Ranch. He discovered the dead body of Blake Wilkins lying in front of the open doorway. Sheriff Hedges was immediately notified and requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. Morning, Jace. Howdy, Sheriff. Whoa, whoa, Charco. Any trouble getting out here? No. Pretty heavy going, though. Must have been some rain last night. Uh, good thing you didn't try to come out in your car. You'd have been hub deep in mud halfway. Yeah, that's what I figured. Uh, I've already talked to the half-brother Judd back at the ranch house. He's pretty broken up. But I figured you'd want to look at the scene of the shooting before you did any questioning. Yeah. You find anything, Sheriff? Yeah, a couple of things. They left the body right where it was, though. Medical examiner's on his way out. Whose horse is that in the corral? I figure it's the one Blake Wilkins rode out here last night. Followed the tracks out here, just one set of them. Hmm. Any footprints around? No, yeah, couldn't see any. A lot of gravel, rocks around. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the body. Hmm. Lying in front of the open door. Bullet ended over the right eye. The rain must have washed some of the blood away. Hmm. Bullet came out the back of the head, higher up. That means it was traveling in an upward angle. Yeah, that's right, Jase. Went clear through him and then carried through the shack. Come on inside, I'll show you. You got the bullet here in my pocket. We well, found it out back. Here it is. What's left of it? Huh. Sure smashed up. I'm afraid it won't help us any. You can take a look at the roof, Jase. Back wall over that shelf of provisions. Yeah. It's a bullet hole, all right. Let's go back outside. I'd say Blake was just about your height, Sheriff. Looks like. I want you to stand here beside the body and hold your hand out of the level of your forehead. My forehead? Yeah. That'll represent the approximate height of the bullet when it hit Blake. Yeah, that's it. What are you packing up for, Chase? I'm sighting along your hand on the bullet hole in the roof. I get it. You're trying to figure out where that shot was fired from. Yeah. And it's leading me straight to this old watering trough. Okay, Sheriff. You can take your hand down. You figure the killer was hiding behind the watering trough when he shot Blake? Behind it or in it. Bottom of the trough split. It doesn't hold any water. Don't see any footprints around. Whoever it was could have walked on this gravel and rocks over to that gully there. And there's water in the bottom of the gully. Well, however he did it, he sure covered his tracks. Mm. Guess Blake must have heard a noise outside the shack, come outside and got shot. Yeah. But I'm wondering what Blake was doing out here at this shack in the first place. Search me. Didn't even know Blake had come home till I got the report of the shooting this morning. About two years ago, he and Callie Briggs from the next ranch over ran off to get married. According to Judd, Blake returned home just last night. And made a beeline out to this shack in the rain? Uh, does seem a little peculiar. Come on, let's ride back to the ranch house and see if Blake's half-brother can throw any light on the matter. <laughs> No doubt about it, Jace. That horse at the shack is the one Blake rode out there last night. He backtracked the hoof marks all the way here to the ranch house. Yeah, just one set of prints, all right. Well, we thought it was heavy going for our horses this morning. It must have been a lot worse last night from the way those hoof marks of Blake sank down in the mud. Yeah, I noticed that. Is that the half-brother on the back porch? Yeah, that's Judd Wilkins. Hey, oh, Sheriff. Oh, boy. Oh, Judd. Yeah, this is Ranger Pearson, Judd. He's in charge of the investigation of your brother's murder. Huh? Well, got any line on the killer so far, Ranger? Not much yet. As I understand it, Judd, your brother had been away from home about two years. That's right. When did he get back? Walked in last night at supper time, about 6.30, I guess. Albert Briggs can verify the time for you. He's having supper with me. Any reason the time of Blake's return home should need verifying, Judd? Huh? No, no, I just, I just figure you want all the facts straight, Ranger. Yeah, what happened when Blake walked in? Well, right after Blake walked in, Alva walked out. Oh, why? When Blake told us he and Callie had split up. Seems Alva didn't know anything about it. Neither did I, as a matter of fact. But Alva, being Callie's paw, took it pretty hard. Seemed to hold it against Blake. Guess he thought it was all Blake's fault. 
Matter of fact, I had to pull him away from Blake's throat. I see. Of course, the way Blake explained it to me later wasn't his fault at all. But Alva didn't wait for any explanation. How'd you feel about Blake coming home, Judd? Well, I reckon the way any brother'd feel. I told him I was glad he's back. It'd be good to have him help me with the ranch. Judd, there's one thing that's bothering me. Maybe you can throw a little light on it. Yeah, what is it, Ranger? How come your brother went out to that line shack the first night he got home? Well, I decided to ride over to Alva's and try to straighten things out with him. He said he'd stay at the shack the rest of the night so he could give us a hand with the rest of the vaccinations first thing in the morning, so off he rode. I see. What time was that? Mm, around 7.30, I guess. What did you do after that? Me? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll see now. Around 9, I sent for my, my ranch hand, Tom Billings. Told him about Blake being back and also had him help me check some tally sheets. I'd say that was mm, about 10.30 when we got through. Tom went on back to the bunkhouse? That's right, sure. And you? I turned in. You didn't leave the ranch house? Me? Uh, no. Are you sure about that? Of course I'm sure. What are you getting at, Ranger? I'm just trying to get at the truth, Wilkins. Now, wait a minute. You think maybe I killed Blake? I'm not thinking anything right now. I'm just asking questions. I don't like the kind of questions you're asking. Think I'd kill my own brother in cold blood? Take it easy, Judd. Look, Ranger. You know who discovered Blake's body? Tom Billings, my own ranch hand. You know how he happened to ride out there this morning? Because I told him to. I wanted to meet Blake and start to work. Now, would I kill Blake and then go out of my way to make sure his body'd be discovered? It'd be pretty stupid, wouldn't it? Well, Judd, I'll go along with you far enough to say a stupid man wouldn't have done that. Nah, I didn't kill Blake. Then you got nothing to worry about. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry I lost my temper, Ranger. It's just a... You know, a thing like this hits you pretty hard. Yeah, sure. Where can I find this ranch hand of yours, Tom Billings? He's waiting for you down at the bunkhouse. I told him to stick around in case you wanted to question him, Jason. Good. Let's have a talk with him, Sheriff. Whoever that skunk is, Ranger, I sure hope you get it. Thanks. What do you think, Jace? About Judd Wilkins? Yeah. I don't know, Sheriff. Tells a pretty straightforward story, but listening to it, I somehow got the idea it was a little too straightforward. Almost like he might have been rehearsing it. Yeah. Sounded like that to me, too. Well, we'll check up on as much of his story as we can from Tom Billings. Here's the bunkhouse. Come on in. Howdy. Tom Billings? That's right, Ranger. I've been waiting for you. And Pat's an old pair of jeans. Jang, if I'm much of a seamstress, though. Oh, I don't know. Seems to me I've seen worse looking patches than that. Billings, you're the one who discovered Blake Wilkins' body this morning, aren't you? Yeah. I almost lost my breakfast. Pretty bad sight. Who told you to ride out that way? Judd. He wanted me to meet Blake and get started with the vaccinations again. Check so far, Jason. Yeah. How about last night, Billings? Judd says he called you up to the ranch house. Yeah, he did. Wanted to tell me about Blake being back and have me help him check some tally sheets. What time did you go up? Right around 9 o'clock. And what time did you come back here? Oh, about a quarter till 11. The rain had just stopped. I come back here to the bunkhouse and turned in. And then this morning you rode out to the line shack? That's right, Ranger. Okay. I guess that'll be all, Billings. Come on, Sheriff. Well, one thing sure, Jace. Judd's time last night is accounted for from nine till about quarter to eleven. Yeah. Of course, we don't know how much that means until they've completed the autopsy and can tell us the time of death. Yeah. You know, there's another angle to this case you could probably stand looking into. I know what you're going to say, Sheriff. Alva Briggs. Yeah. According to Judd, Alva was pretty mad at Blake last night when he found out Blake and Callie had split up. We're going to look into that angle right now, Sheriff. Let's take a run over to the Briggs Ranch and have a talk with Alva. See if we can find out just how mad he was at Blake Wilkins. <laughs> You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Sweet Revenge, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We drove over to Alva Briggs Ranch. We could see from a distance that his car wasn't in the shed. Then as we got closer, we noticed a kid sitting on the front porch. Hmm. 
Who's that kid over there? Don't know, Jase. Morning. Looking for Alpha Briggs. Oh, I thought I'm looking for Senor Briggs, sir. Now, what do you mean? Well, he's nowhere around. He told me to be here this morning and that he would pay me for feeding his chickens and horses. So I come this morning, like he told me. I wait, but he don't come. Jase. Yeah. Looks like Alpha Briggs got called away all of a sudden. I'm going to put out an all-points-wanted bulletin on him right now. <laughs> Checking in town, I learned that Alva Briggs had caught the Dallas bus that morning. I notified Company B. Four hours later, Briggs was picked up at the Continental Trailways Depot in Dallas by Ranger C.B. Wade, who brought him back to Sheriff Hedge's office. After a brief talk with Ranger Wade out in the hall, I came back into the room. I'd like to know the meaning of this, Ranger. We'd like to know why you suddenly decided to take a trip, Mr. Briggs. Well, I reckon that's my business. You're wrong about that. It's our business, too. The way it looks right now, you get mad at Blake Wilkins, he turns up dead, and you leave town. But I didn't even know about Blake being killed till that other ranger picked me up getting off the bus in Dallas. I still want to know why you took off from your ranch this morning. All right. Last night, Blake told me he and my daughter Callie had split up in Dallas. They come as a bad shock. So this morning, I decided to head for Dallas to see if I could locate Callie and find out what happened. Get her to come back home with me if she would. I see. You left the Wilkins Ranch about 6.30 last night. Oh, that's right. Where'd you go? Home. You stay home the rest of the night? Yeah. Any way of proving that, Alva? Well, I guess not. I live alone. Ranger, I didn't kill Blake Wilkins. Sure, I felt like it for a second or two when he told me about him and Kelly, but thinking about it later, I got over it. Guess when a couple splits up, it ain't ever completely one person's fault. I didn't kill him. If you didn't, you'll want to cooperate then. Cooperate? I'm asking you to postpone your trip to Dallas. I want you to keep yourself real handy until this investigation's wound up. All right, Ranger. You'll find me at Morang. He's got no alibi for any part of last night, Jase. No, he hasn't. There are a couple of things that make me doubt that he killed Blake. What are they? If he did kill Blake, why'd he wait till this morning to take off from his ranch? Well... Another thing. Alva walked out of the Wilkins Ranch house right after Blake arrived. How did he know Blake was going to be out at the shack? Why, Blake told Judd he was going to ride over and talk to Alva. Maybe that's how Alva found out. But we know Blake never got as far as Alva's place. Those horse tracks led right to the shack and stopped there. See, that's right. You think Judd was lying to us, trying to make it look bad for Alva? I don't know. Then there's the matter of motive. You find out, like Alva did, that your daughter split up with a guy and you think it's his fault? You might knock a few teeth loose over it, but as for killing him on account of it, I don't know. Well, speaking of motive, how about Judd? That's just what I'm going to follow up next, Sheriff. See if I can find a motive for Judd Wilkins to kill his half-brother. I checked into the background of the Wilkins family and found out about several instances of friction between the brothers. But Judd had always been envious of Blake. That started me thinking about the father's death and his will. The executor of the estate was a lawyer named Sam Farris. Sheriff and I dropped in to see him at his office. Yes, Ranger. The will's in probate, but I'm very familiar with the terms and provisions of it. What are they? It was a sort of a peculiar will. I told old man Wilkins at the time he made it that it might not stand up in court. I had him change it a little, but I'm still not sure it's valid. Of course, it doesn't matter much now, Blake being dead. Uh, incidentally, I suppose you questioned Judd about the shooting? Yeah, I have, Mr. Ferris. Why do you ask? Because of the way the will read. Oh? Just how does it read? Have Blake returned home of his own accord any time during the probate period, the land, the buildings, and the stock were his. Chase? That's very interesting, Mr. Ferris. What provision was made for Judd? Now, he was to get 25% of the profits from the ranch, and if Blake didn't show up before the probate period was up... Judd would get the whole thing. I tried to talk old man Wilkins into setting it up as a trust fund. Boiling it down then, Mr. Ferris, if Blake came back of his own accord, the place was his, and Judd, in effect, would be working for him. Well, that's about the size of it. Well, Chase, that should do it, all right. We know Judd was always envious of Blake, so now up pops Blake to take the ranch away from him. Yeah, there's our motive, all right. Mr. Ferris, uh, you got a copy of that will? Yes, but I'm afraid I couldn't turn over my copy to you, Ranger. Okay, we'll look over the original at the courthouse, Sheriff. I want to study that will. We 
We went through the will with a fine-tooth comb. When we returned to the sheriff's office, the autopsy report was lying on his desk. What's it say, Jace? We were all set to arrest Judd Wilkins, weren't we? Still are all set, far as I'm concerned. Why? Looks like there's not going to be an arrest. What are you talking about? We just found out Judd Wilkins had plenty of motive for killing Blake. Sheriff, all the motive in the world doesn't do us any good when the facts are against us. You still can't be in two places at once. I don't follow you, Jace. Look, Tom Billings told us he was with Judd at the ranch house the night of the shooting, from about nine until quarter of eleven. That's right. Wait a minute. You mean that autopsy report Blake says... Wilkins was killed at a shack six miles from the ranch house. And according to this report, the time of death was somewhere between 9 and 9.30. Well, Jace, there goes our case against Judd, then. Right up in smoke. Sure looks that way. If Tom Billings is with him from about 9 to a quarter to 11, it's a cinch Judd couldn't have killed Blake at the shack. So where does that leave us? Right in the middle of nowhere. What are you going to do? Only one thing to do, Sheriff. Go right back to the beginning and start all over again. And the beginning in this case is that shack where Blake was murdered. Jay's hanged if I see what good this is doing us. We've gone over this shack just like we did before. You had me hold my hand up again, you sighted along it to the bullet hole in the wall, and we're still no further along than we were. I know it, Sheriff. The only thing I can figure is that we don't have all the facts in the case yet. Maybe somebody else we don't know about shot Blake. I think we've already got all the important facts, Sheriff. But facts are funny things. You've got to put them together in the right combination to get the right answer. And I think that's where we've gone wrong. But, Jace, I don't see what other combination there is. You've reconstructed this the only logical way it could be. We find Blake lying in front of that open doorway, a bullet hole clean through his head. We know it's line of flight after that because of the bullet hole in the roof by this back wall. Yeah. Right over this shelf of provisions. So where's the mistake in that? I don't know, except there must be something wrong about... Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What is it? Take a look at this sugar bowl, Sheriff. It was right under the bullet hole. I don't see anything the matter with it. Look at the sugar inside it. Nothing the matter with that either. Yeah. Well, that's the point, Sheriff. Right? You ever see sugar that's had a little water dropped on it? Why, sure. It gets sort of crusty. And stays that way. Yeah, but I... Remember what Tom Billings told us? That the rain stopped about quarter to eleven? Blake was shot between nine and nine-thirty. That's right. Over an hour before it stopped... Jace! Yeah. A bullet hole over the sugar bowl would have let a few drops of rain on the sugar. But the sugar's dry. And there aren't any water stains on the shelf, either. That means that bullet hole in the roof wasn't made until after it stopped raining. It also means we'd better get back to the Wilkins Ranch house on the double. We headed for the ranch house. Judd was nowhere in sight, which suited me fine at the moment. We eased inside the house. I didn't find what I was looking for in the front room, so we went up into the bedroom. What do you figure on finding up here, Jace? I think I've already found it, Sheriff. That calendar on the wall. Looks like it's hanging mighty high. Yeah. Let's take a look behind it. A bullet hole in the wall, Jace? Yeah. I got my knife here. I'll, I'll dig around it. Yeah, it's in here, all right. Yeah. Here you are, Sheriff. The slug. Well, I'll be. You see? That's where Judd got the idea. He was probably standing on the stairs and shot and killed Blake right here in this room. Then he noticed that the bullet went clear through into this wall. That's why he fired a bullet through the rear of the shack, to make it look like Blake had been killed out there. You mean all the time Tom Billings was downstairs with Judd that night, Blake's body was lying right up here in the bedroom? That's just what I mean. Judd must have shot Blake around 9 o'clock, then called Billings over to the house right afterward as a cover. Then after Billings left at a quarter to 11... Judd cleaned up the room and took the body out to the shack on horseback. Yeah. I thought those hoof marks were cut down awful deep, even for wet ground. That horse was carrying double, Judd and Blake's body. After he placed the body, he probably walked along that gravel to the gully and doubled back to the ranch on foot. He was sure trying to pull a fast one on us. He almost got away with it, too. I reckon we got a case... All right, the door closed. Nobody down there in the living room. Come on, Sheriff. Reckon Judd could have come in without us hearing him? Maybe. Take a look in the kitchen. Yeah, the 
Kitchen's empty, too. Let's look out the back door. There he is, Jace, running for the car shed. Come on. Judd, hold it. Stop where you are. Hey, he ducks around the corner of the car shed. Corral's back there. He might be trying for a horse. We'll see as soon as we get around this corner. Hey, take cover, Sheriff. Shot came from the bunkhouse. Probably ducked in there to get a gun. Judd, this won't do you any good. Come on out of there. He's gone plumb crazy trying to shoot it out with both of us. Judd, I'll give you just one minute to come out of that bunkhouse with your hands in the air. You want me to come in here and get me, Ranger? I don't have to, Judd. I'm going to send for you. I circled around the ranch house to my car in front, got something out of it, and crawled back to the sheriff. A tear gas bomb. Yeah. This is your last chance, Judd. Here's my answer, Ranger. Okay. Here's mine. Hey! Come on, Sheriff. Let's ease up closer. He'll be coming out of that door any minute now. Tear gas. Ranger, you... I'll take this side of this door, Sheriff. You take the other. I, I can't see. I, I can't see. I'll take that gun. By you. I, 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 oh, my eyes... Yeah, they'll clear up. You're under arrest, Judd. I, I... You had a pretty neat scheme figured out, Judd. But you got tripped up by a little bowl of sugar. Sugar? Yeah. I'll bet you'll hate that word sugar for the rest of your life. You know, Sheriff, I got a strong hunch that isn't going to be very long. Judd Wilkins was tried and convicted of the murder of his brother, Blake. On the morning of June 16, 1945, in the state penitentiary at Huntsville, he was executed in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lamont Johnson, Bill Johnstone, Stacey Harris, Rye Billsbury, and Wilms Herbert. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bob Reif, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Here is a special announcement. Two weeks from tonight, that Sunday, March 4th, Tales of the Texas Rangers will relinquish its time period for one week only so that you can hear a full hour-and-a-half dramatization of Shakespeare's immortal Hamlet, presented by Theatre Guild on the air. It's radio's most exciting dramatic event when John Gielgud, Pamela Brown, and Dorothy McGuire bring the pages of Hamlet to life on Theatre Guild on the air. Sunday, March 4th. But listen again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure starring Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Now the $64 question. Tomorrow here, the Boston Pops on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from
from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The Trap. It is 1.10 a.m., May 17th, 1948. The highway across a barren and thinly populated portion of West Texas is deserted, except for a truck and trailer pushing steadily westward toward El Paso. Boy, that nap felt good. You sure were snoring. I could barely hear the motor. How long was I asleep? Since 8 o'clock last night. Almost 1 a.m. now. <sighs> How are we doing? Hey, we'll be in El Paso by 6. We're right on schedule. You want me to take the wheel? No. no. Wait till we gas up at Frito Junction. It's only another 50 miles. Okay. Yeah, I sure will be glad to get home and see my wife. <laughs> you called a long distance when we stopped for supper. Yeah. But I'm not an old-timer like you. This is our first baby we're expecting. You already got four. Ah, don't let me kid you, Sims. You feel the same way about all of them, no matter how many you have. What are you hoping for? Oh, just a healthy kid, I guess. That's all. Although, I- I'd kind of like a little girl. You get one, you have a real picnic. Girls are born smarter than we are. My youngest one. She can work me over for anything she wants faster than a quarter horse can get moving. <laughs> you don't look like you're feeling any pain from it, Grover. <laughs> I ain't. I ain't. It's a big kick, getting the things they want. Yeah, but don't get me wrong, I'm just as fond of the three boys, too. Yeah. But, well, a girl does get under your skin a little more. They are more affectionate, like. Boy grows up and you want to kiss him. <laughs> He kicks up his heels. They get to be eight, nine years old. The closest you get to him is shaking hands. You know what I mean? Sure, sure, Joe. <laughs> I guess we were the same with our folks. I wouldn't trade them for anything, though, boys or girls. When they're your own blood, you... Well, you'll find out, Sims. You got a lot of fun and living ahead of you. They'll worry you when they get sick, and they'll break your heart when they get kid troubles that you can't help them with, but... Nothing you'll ever have will mean as much to you as your young'uns. <laughs> I've been worrying about mine already, and she... He? <laughs> well, whatever it is, ain't even <laughs> here yet. I keep wondering if I'll be able to make it. You know, bring them up, educate them, help them to be somebody. Yeah, that's something else you'll worry about with each new one. Man, I'm so scared now, I think I'll just settle for one kid and leave it at that. <laughs> that's what I said 12 years ago with our first, but you'll change your mind. Yeah, I guess so. Mary says that she hey, wants... Hey, hey, Huh? What's that ahead? Where? Oh, somebody waving a red lantern. They must be coming to that narrow bridge over Lannan's Creek. Well, you suppose it's been washed out again by a flash flood? Yeah, it could be, although it don't look like there's been any rain here since we started the whole east four days ago. Just the same, they got it blocked. Yeah. Look, Grover, they put up a detour sign. Yeah, it probably wants us to go to the left end of the old road. No, sign points to the right, and the fellow with the lantern is waving us that way. Yeah, I... I guess he knows what he's doing. Don't look like much of a road this way, does it? Oh, it's going to be mighty rough going. I hope this don't last too long. Hey, this ain't even a road. Oh, it's just a little dead-end turnoff. That guy must have been crazy sending us in here. Backing this rig out is sure going to be a job. Ah, what a dumb trick. I'm going to walk back and ask him what in the name of blazes made him turn us off this way. I'll come with you. You'd think they'd have a highway patrol car stationed there to... Wait a minute. What's the matter? Look by the road. The guy with the lamp is moving that detour sign. Get back in the truck, quick. What is it, Grover? What's wrong? It's like a hijack. Get it rolling backwards and don't mind what you hit. Just keep going. Grover! Grover! Hey, don't shoot anymore! Don't shoot! He's hurt! You can take it! I said you could take everything. You didn't have... Mary... My kid. At 9 p.m. the following night, the bodies of Warren Grover and Luther Sims were discovered, and the sheriff notified. He called for help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Here are the bodies, Jace. They must have been dragged into the brush when the truck was stolen. Lucky thing Mr. Archer here found him. Mighty lucky. Could have been here for days. How'd you happen to come across him, Mr. Archer? 
Oh, it, it weren't me. One of my kids found him. We uh, pulled off the highway, fixing to make camp for the night. The boy was gathering wood for the fire. Then out of yelp and come legging out of here like a scared jackrabbit. You make a habit of camping out at night with your family? There ain't nothing much a man can do about it when he ain't working. Them motels and places cost money. Where do you come from? Up Arkansas way. We're heading for California. Migratory workers, huh? Mm. You can talk to his family later if you want, Jace. I let Archer pull his car into a clearing up the highway about 200 yards the other side of the bridge. He didn't want to keep the kids around here. Eh, if you ain't got nothing else to ask me, I'd like to get back to my wife, Crumb Shaky. All right, go ahead. But when you get to the car, stay put. I ain't got no place special to go. Thank you. You got a flashlight, Jace? Mine's about to peter out. Yeah. There, you can give your batteries a rest. You say they were due in El Paso at 6 this morning, huh? Eh? Yep, was on schedule, too, until they got here, I reckon. Made their supper stop on time last night. The company checked back. When'd you get the request to look for the truck? Got the description and license number early this afternoon when they was overdue and nobody had heard from them. The company figured if they'd had a breakdown, they'd have called in. According to their schedule, they should have reached this spot a little after midnight last night. And whoever took that truck had plenty of time to get a long ways from here with it before sunup. Not much chance of anybody spotting them. That's right. We'd better take a look around. I've been all over the ground between here and the highway, but I guess it won't hurt to look again. Condition my light was in, I might have missed something. I can show you where they were when they dropped blood stains on the ground out here. Yeah, I saw them. Right where the truck was. Stains aren't far from the tire marks. They're funny tires, Jace. Different pattern right smack down the center of them. Well, no, those inside tracks were made by Archer's car when he drove in. Covered part of the truck marks. Boy, this place is rutted. He'd fall right into the same track. Hm. I didn't think of that. Ah, here's something. What is it? Cartridge shell. Look at it. Forty-five caliber army automatic. Oh, and here's another one. Well, we won't have to wait for an autopsy to tell us what the murder weapon was. Hey, I just thought of something. What? That forty-five army automatic. There's an army camp about 40 miles further on, j- just 10 miles this side of Frito Junction. Oh, I'm afraid that won't help us, Sheriff. Number marking on these shells is a 17. That's the old 1917 ammunition series, World War I. No camp would be using ammo that old. Mm, too bad. I thought for a minute we might have a fast lead. You arranged to have the bodies moved? Yep, sent my deputy to town for an undertaker. Good. Let's walk out to Archer's car, talk to his wife and kids. There's one thing I don't understand, Jace. Why did they pull their truck off the road? A trucker riding alone might do it to grab some sleep, but not a schedule rig with two drivers. I can't figure that either. Archer's car's up this way, other side of the bridge. Might as well leave your car right where it is, not much of a walk. Sure. Hold it, Sheriff. What is it? This mark just off the road shoulder here. Hmm. Sort of a circle in the dirt. Yeah. And whatever made the circle was wet and kind of oily. What do you suppose made it? Well, it would make an oily, round impression that size. Oh, I don't know. Unless maybe it was a lantern. That's what it was, all right. And here's something else. Four small rectangular marks in the earth. Base of each mark, about two by four. Well, I can't figure that. Unless somebody had a table out here. I don't think it was a table. Another thing that would make four mark space like that's a wooden sawhorse. Did this bridge ever wash out? Sometimes, when there's a flash flood. Hey, I see what you're aiming at. When there is a flood, Highway Patrol sets up a detour sign. Sends traffic through that road over across the highway. When that happened last? Oh, not in a couple of months. Now, these marks aren't that old. Somebody detoured that truck into the dead-end road on this side. Lantern and Sawhorse were setting here until they were moved onto the road to set up a block. They must have had that particular truck pegged then. Came through at a time when there isn't much traffic between the last town to the east and Frito Junction. Come on, let's talk to Archer. You got a list of the cargo the truck was carrying? Told my deputy to wire a request for it after we found the truck had been stolen. It'll come through to my office. Good, because we'll have to track this down through cargo. I got a hunch that the truck has been emptied and ditched by now. Archer didn't know any more than he'd already told us, and his wife and three pale, undernourished kids couldn't add anything. We waited until the bodies were picked up and then headed back for town. The next morning, there was a wire from the trucking company waiting at the sheriff's office, a list of the missing truck's cargo. Here's a report on the cargo, Jace. Valued at $39,000. Let's see. A shipment of automobile radios, huh? Well, that's a break. Why? 
Because they all have serial numbers. It'd be a lot of work if they try and change the numbers, and if they don't, one of the sets will turn up sooner or later. Yeah, but they didn't send the numbers through to us, Jace. Just the set make and model. I'm radioing my headquarters to get them. Come on. Austin can contact the manufacturer and have him send a complete list of the serials through. Then they can distribute the list to all law enforcement agencies on a statewide bulletin. We don't stand much chance of cracking this if we have to wait for a hot car radio to turn up. Don't worry. We're not going to wait. We've got plenty of other things to do. How many deputies you got handy? Three. How about send them back along the highway? We know where Grover and Sims made their supper stop. I'd like to find out if they made any stops after that, before they were killed. Good idea. As a matter of fact, whoever stole the truck may have turned it around and headed back that way. Killers may have been spotted. It's a chance. On the other hand, maybe I ought to send one man toward Frito Junction in El Paso. Just in case the truck kept heading west. Never mind. I'll handle that part of it myself. I'm heading for Frito Junction as soon as I can make that radio call. I put through a request for the serial numbers, then headed for Frito Junction. On the way, I got a radio call from KTXA. The missing truck had always made a regular stop at the mobile gas station in Frito Junction. When I got to the station, I sent for the man who'd been on duty the night the truck was hijacked. Yep, I was on duty night before last, Ranger, but Grover and Sims didn't stop here. I know they didn't. They never got this far. What I want to know is, did you see their truck? The station's right at the crossroads. If the truck came through with somebody else driving it, there's a chance you might have seen it. Ranger, I'd like to help you, but, well, there ain't much business during the night, even though the boss does keep the place open as an accommodation of truckers. I usually stretch out on a cot in the office. If a truck stops, I get up. If it don't, I just hear it go past. Any other stations around here open at night? Nope. The truck Grover and Sims were driving always stopped here, didn't it? Yep. Company they drove for has a credit account here. They haul between El Paso and Houston. Well, their tanks are always just about dry when they hit here on the return haul from Houston. I see. You mean the truck would be too low on gas to go much further than this without filling up, providing it came this way? That's right. Thanks. That's a big help. You're welcome, Ranger. Wish I could help more. Grover and Sims were pretty nice guys. That's the trouble with a killing. The wrong people usually get killed. And it sounds like you've got an impatient customer out there. Yep, one of the soldiers from Camp Boulder. Boys are busy on the pumps. I might as well help him. Hey, he's got the drive blocked. I'll ask him to back up so you can get your car and trailer out. It's all right. He doesn't seem to want gas. May want directions to someplace. Hey, you got a shop here? Yeah, but you have to pull around the back. You're blocking the ranger's car. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Just want to make sure you're going to help me. Doesn't seem to be much wrong with that motor. There isn't anything wrong with it. In top shape. And what do you want to put it in the shop for? Got a new radio. Thought you might be able to install it for me. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case. The Trap, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. A soldier with a new car radio. It didn't have to mean anything, but it might. The make and model of the set he had matched what I was looking for. I got the serial number from the carton that came in and phoned it through to the sheriff for a fast check against the manufacturer's list. Then I went into the shop to ask a few questions. We'll have to drill holes for the antenna, I guess. Unless you want to wear it in your hat, I will. <laughs> Looks like a good set. Yeah. yeah. Pretty expensive. The fella told me it sells for about 85 bucks. What'd you pay for it? Well, I, uh, I didn't buy it. I made a deal for it, sort of. What kind of a deal? What are you asking me that for, Ranger? Something wrong? I didn't say that. I was just wondering what kind of a deal a fella could get on a car radio. The man you got this from have any others he wanted to get rid of? Well, I, I, I don't think so. He just gave me this... For a trade, you know. On what? Something I had that he needed. Uh, look, my pass is only good for a couple hours. I didn't think it'd be this long. Maybe I better let it go, and I'll, I'll come back in next time I'm in town. Okay. I think you better stay around. But my pass... Maybe I... I can get you a little extension of time. What's the camp number? I'll call your commanding officer. Well, what do you want to do that for? Yeah, well, what's the matter, Ranger? What is it? It's that radio. Grover and Sims were hauling a truckload of auto radios when they were hijacked and killed. What? You telling me that radio's stolen? No, I'm not. Not yet. 
But I'm waiting for a check on the serial number, and you're not leaving here until I get it. Oh, look, you got to believe me. The guy gave me that set. Yeah, and you've been pretty evasive about telling me why he gave it to I you. I told you it was a trade. For what? Come on, talk up. Well, I... I can't tell you that. Get me in trouble. If this is one of the sets taken from two murdered truck drivers, you'll be in plenty of trouble unless I know where and how you got it. Sounds like you better tell him, soldier. I got the set in exchange for some gasoline. Gasoline, huh? All right, go ahead. Well, it was night before last. Just after two o'clock, I, I just started guard duty at camp. My post was along the fence by the motor pool from two to four. Hey, Ranger, that's not long after the time you said Grover was... Never mind, Milligan. Go ahead. Well, I... I heard this car stopped near the fence. You sure it wasn't a truck? No, no, it was a car. So I, I walked over to the fence where it was parked. I, I sort of gave the challenge, you know, asked who it was, and a man walked up, said he needed some gas. And you gave it to him, just like that? No, huh? no, no. He, he said he'd pay me for it. I told him it was against regulations. Then he, he said it wasn't for him. He said a couple of women were stranded down the highway in their car. And then he, he said he'd give me a car radio. Oh, well, it's Seemed like a good deal, so I opened a pump and filled some cheap cans for him. How many gallons? Twenty-five. And you didn't think there was anything wrong with a trade like that? An $85 radio for 25 gallons of gas? Well, the guy was stuck and that... How could he be stuck? He was only ten miles from the station and it's open all night. Well, maybe he didn't know that. He knew it all right. But he didn't want to bring a stolen truck into this station and he didn't want to get that much gas in cans from a place that might be checked. Look, Ranger, please, I... I'm up for discharge in a couple of months our camp is being deactivated. I don't want to get in bad. You should have thought of that before you started to ladle out government gasoline. What kind of sidearms do you carry at the camp when you do a guard trick? Uh, regulation Army 45. Any 1917 series ammo? None that I ever saw. Are you going to give me a break? I'm not a judge. I can't give breaks. You're the only key I've got to two dead men. I'll call your post and have the MPs pick you up. The gasoline's the Army's business, but this radio is mine if it's stolen property. How could I know it was stolen? Can you describe the man you got it from? No, it was too dark. Besides, besides, there were two men. One of them stayed in the car. It'd help your case a lot if you could tell us what they looked like, even what kind of a car they were driving. Well, it was dark, I tell you. They talked to each other, call each other by name? Well, yeah, yeah. The, the fellow I gave the gas to, he called the other one in the car, and he said, drive up closer, will you, sonny boy? Sonny boy? Well, that's not a name. Probably just a wisecracker nickname. Well, I'm just telling you what I heard. I'm trying to do everything I can to help you. Yep. Yeah. Just a minute. Ranger, it's for you, the Sheriff. Thanks. Hello, Sheriff. Howdy, Jase. That soldier's radio is on the stolen list, all right. But I got someone my deputies dug up. Grover and Sims did make another stop after they had their supper. At 11.30 the night they were killed. Where? Roadside diner. Just stopped for coffee. At least Sims had coffee there. Told the proprietor that Grover was asleep in the cab of the truck. You talk to the proprietor yourself? Sure did. Drove out seam as soon as the deputy gave me the report. It's Watson's Diner. A lot of truckers eat there or stop to coffee up when they're riding late. Watson know if they had a hitchhiker with them? Any rider they might have picked up? He says no, but he didn't go out to the truck, of course. From what he says, Sims was the only one in the place except for some traveling salesman who was playing the pinball machine. A fellow named Sonny Boy Jensen. Sonny Boy? That's right, Jace. What you getting excited about? Talk to Watson again. Find out what he knows about Sonny Boy Jensen, who he is and where he comes from. Then meet me back at your office. I'll get there as fast as I can roll. The army camp was on my way, so I took the soldier with me and turned him over to the camp authorities to be held. I kept a lead foot on the gas pedal as I drove past the bridge in the side road where the truckers had been hijacked and slain. It took me almost two hours to reach the county seat. The sheriff was standing in front of his office as I drove up. Inform KTX, say you have any change of location. We'll keep in touch with you. Howdy, Jase. Howdy. What'd you get? Something that might fit. That Jensen's been traveling up and down this highway for years, selling electrical appliances to farmers and ranchers, mostly. Men like that would have good market for car radios once that shipment cooled off. He could be our boy, all right. You get any line on where he comes from? Works out of El Paso, mostly. But his home's a small ranch about 150 miles southwest of Frito. Sonny Boy Jensen can't be his real name. No, it's Bertram Jensen. They just call him Sonny Boy. Watson said he left the diner about five minutes after Sims and Grover pulled out. Probably passed him on the highway. 
Had them all staked out and set up that roadblock. You better climb in. Going to El Paso? No, I'll turn south out of Frito and head for Jensen's Ranch. I don't think he'd take that hot merchandise into El Paso. Even if he got there before daylight, he'd run into some traffic, and that's the trucking company's home base. He'd be taking a chance on loading any place in the city. Now, I see what you mean. You better check on him while we're rolling. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA. Go ahead, Unit 10. This unit en route to Jensen Ranch near County Line, 150 miles southwest of Frito Junction. 10 4. Request check on subject Bertram Jensen, alias Sonny Boy Jensen, El Paso appliance dealer and owner of ranch this unit is headed toward. 10 4. Unit 10, clear. KTXA, Austin. I've been thinking, Jace. This couldn't have been a one-man job. Jensen couldn't drive the truck and his car after the hijack. It wasn't a one-man job. The soldier who gave him the gas they needed for the truck said there were two men in the car. Two men with a bad murder rap hanging over them are liable to fight, Jace. They sure are, Sheriff. Better take the safety off your gun right now. There mightn't be time later. Unit 10, go ahead, KTXA. I have a report for you on Bertram Jensen. No record of Sonny Boy alias. Served three years in federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, 1919 to 1921, for theft of army material from government armory. Had accomplice named Dolph Muni, convicted on same charge. No record on either since then. 10-4, Unit 10, clear. KTXA, Austin. That may answer a couple of our questions, Sheriff. Yep. Where Jensen got that Army 45 and the 1917 ammo series, and who his partner was, if you think he might have kept in touch with Dolph Mooney for almost 20 years. There's an old saying, Sheriff, about birds of a feather. It was after dark when we reached the Jensen Ranch. When the door opened, I knew it was Jensen. There were little wrinkles under his eyes, and his temples were gray, but his face held a youthful softness, as some faces do, whether 16 or 60. It wasn't hard to understand why they called him Sonny Boy. Well, it's been a long time since I've seen a ranger around here. You, uh, looking for somebody? Sheriff and I heard you might be able to get us a bargain on a few things. Uh, sure. What are you interested in? Automobile radios. Uh, I got a few in my warehouse in El Paso. Thought you might have something around here. No, I'm, I'm afraid not. Uh, and maybe you know somebody who has. Uh, no, I, I I don't know many people. I live alone here. Don't see much of anybody. Had any company this evening? No. Two ashtrays in this room don't agree with you. There's smoldering butts in both of them. So unless you smoke two cigarettes at a time and walk back and forth across the room to put them out, you haven't been alone. Oh, all right. A neighbor's visited me. Is that a crime? No. Where is he? In the kitchen. Call him. Don't go for him. Just call him from here. Uh, Doc? Hey, Doc! What's this Doc business, Janet? Oh. oh, I didn't hear anybody come in. Jensen tells us you've been visiting him. Where are you from? From Borderville. Well, that's about 50 miles from here. Yeah, Jensen said you were a neighbor. Well, that's right, ain't it? Distance don't mean much in Texas. <laughs> I I just dropped in on Jensen unexpected. Matter of fact, I, I was just washing up fixing the start for home. Yeah, he he's just leaving. Oh, well, go right ahead. Uh, I'll get your coat as soon as closet. Here. Oh, uh, before you open that, I'd like to ask your friend a couple of questions. Fifty miles is kind of a long walk, isn't it? Only way to leave this ranch would be in a car, and if you've got one parked outside, we didn't notice it. Uh, I was going to lend him mine. Oh, I see. You said you dropped in unexpectedly. How'd you get here without a car? Why, uh, hitched a ride. Somebody dropped me off the gate. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, if you got nothing else to ask me, I, I'd like to be going. Yeah. Imagine you would, but I'm not quite finished. Maybe you know where I could get a bargain in an automobile radio. Why, well, I don't know nothing about radios. It's too bad. I thought you might. All right, Jensen. Give him his coat. By the way, either you heard from Dolph Muni lately? Well, get out of here. 
You got no right asking questions. You got no warrant. You let us in, Jensen. My story is you broke in, and you ain't going to be able to deny it. Get him on that closet shelf, Gase. Uh, don't try that, Jensen. Uh, Quick, Sheriff. Uh, Kick that gun out of his reach. Uh, got it, Gase. Muni! Uh, he drove through the window. Stay with Jensen. I'll get him. Come on, get him. Get him. I can see you, Muni. You better stop running before I fire. No sense trying to get in that car. It's locked. That was in the air, Muni. The next one won't be. How about it? All right. All right, don't shoot. Just walk this way with your hands high. Uh, I had to steal the radios, but I didn't do the killing. I didn't. I was on the highway with a detour sign when Jensen shot him. Don't tell me, Muni. Save that for the court. Where are the radios? In the barn. Hidden in bales of powder. We ditched the truck in Amber Lake. All right, Muni. Let's go in and get Sonny Boy. You can make your statement at the sheriff's office. Bertram, Sonny Boy Jensen, and Dolph Muni were found guilty of the hijack murder of truck drivers Warren Grover and Luther Sims. Both were sentenced to death in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. Each of the convicted men made an appeal for clemency. And in January of 1949, the sentence of Dolph Muni was commuted to life imprisonment. But the petition of Sonny Boy Jensen was denied. And on the morning of February 19, 1949, he was executed. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks, we want to thank you for the wonderful letters you've been sending to us and the warm and friendly interest you've always shown toward our show. A lot of you have asked the question, what's the title of the theme music heard on Tales of the Texas Rangers? The music you hear at the opening and closing of our show is the Texas Rangers song, written by Sam Coslow and Harry Bain, and is arranged by Robert Armbruster, the conductor of the NBC Orchestra. We're glad to know that so many of you like it. We do, too. And so, Mr. Armbruster, the Texas Ranger song, if you please. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Whitfield Connor, Herb Ellis, Parley Bear, Wilms Herbert, Paul Daboff, and Bill Conrad. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcutt, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Next Sunday, one week from today, Tales of the Texas Rangers will relinquish its broadcast time to enable you to hear one of the season's most dramatic events, the Theater Guild on the Air, full hour-and-a-half production of Hamlet. And make a note to be back with us for another exciting Tales of the Texas Rangers two weeks from tonight. Next week, it's Hamlet. In two weeks, another Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae. Be sure to listen. Now the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the Boston Pops on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. the file.
tales of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Blind Justice. It is 5.45 a.m., March 6, 1940. Pete Salverson, owner of a roadside cafe in West Texas, is opening for business. As he sweeps up in the kitchen, he hears a sound outside the back door. Somebody up back there? That's you, Charlie? Uh, 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 well, what's the matter, boy? Where'd you come from? Come on, feller. Come on, I ain't gonna hurt you. Had <laughs> a boy... Looks like you got here too early to root for anything out of that garbage can, though. And them ribs of yours look like you could use some grub fast. <laughs> hey, now, 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 none of that face licking. You just come on inside and I'll fix you up. Come on. Come on. Let's see. How about this? That is bone and a couple of hunks of stew meat, huh? <laughs> All right, fella. There you are. Dig into that. <laughs> Oh, boy, you sure are beat up and hungry. What's this contraption you got strapped on you? Uh, Pete, you open yet? Oh, oh, howdy, Sheriff. How's the coffee situation? Well, it ain't brewed yet, but I can fix you some up in a minute. Had an early customer here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he hasn't got any money. I'm a cash customer. <laughs> Where'd you get him? Oh, he's rooting in the garbage cans out back. What you doing up around so early? I just came back from Huntsville. Delivered a prisoner up there yesterday. Huh? Hey, that'd be a pretty good-looking dog if he was taken care of. Who owns him? I don't know. Never seen him before. Never did see a leash like the one he's wearing, either. Kind of funny contraption. Look at it. Hey, well, let's see that. What's the matter, Sheriff? Why, this ain't a leash. It's a harness. Huh? This here dog's a C&I dog. One of them dogs is trained to lead blind people? Sure is. He must have run off from his master, then. Well, these dogs don't run off, Pete. I had a missing person's bulletin on a blind man three days ago. This might be his dog. Or a guy that's missing must be around here then, huh? Well, if he is, something must have happened to him. This dog never would have left him. Say, you got change for a dollar in the register? Oh, sure thing. I'm going to hit that phone and get a ranger down here to help. Wherever that dog's master is, I got a hunch we'd better find him quick. Less than one hour after the sheriff's appeal for help, Texas Ranger Jace Pearson joined him at Pete Salveson's roadside cafe. Well, there he is, Ranger. No mistake in that harness if you ever seen one before. It's a C&I dog, all right. You say you found him outside this morning, Salverson? Yeah, half starved, like you can see. Been a good three or four days since he's eaten from the looks of him. Easy, boy. Come here. Nobody's going to hurt you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, fella. It's really sore, isn't it? He's had a bad time, Sheriff. Got a pretty hard clip on the head. Must have been knocked out. Since then, he's traveled through some rough country. And late your gear's got him all sliced up. Footpads are sore from walking. Yeah, but ever since Pete fed him, he's been yelling to get out of here. Reckon he'll be able to lead us back to his master? He'll try if he can make it. He'll have a better chance if a veterinarian works him over first. Where's the nearest one? Uh, foreman at the Wolverine Ranch is a vet. Want to take him out there? Yeah. Meanwhile, you better get yourself a horse. I'll leave my horse trailer here until I get back. You can load your mount in with my horse, Charcoal. It's a double trailer. What makes you think we'll need horses? In a country this dog came through isn't the kind we'll be able to get through in a car. And he came too far for us to follow on foot. Lost dogs sometimes head for home, Jace. Missing persons bulletin came from Ozona in Crockett County. Dog may be headed for there. Only way we'll find out is to follow him. If he heads any other way, it'll be back toward the man he's been trained to take care of. I'm figuring that'll be in a southerly direction from here. Well, how do you know that? All barren country that way, full of lechuguilla. If he came such a long way from any other direction, he'd have run into a town or a ranch and been found before this. I reckon I'll buy that. That makes sense. Get your horse. I'll meet you back here and we'll drive as far south as we can cross country and then turn this dog loose and follow him. I got the dog patched up at the Wolverine Ranch, picked up the sheriff and his horse, and headed south into the Badlands. We switched from car to our horses and turned the dog loose. He circled around for a moment, got his bearings, and then, despite the soreness of his body, started into a limping run. He's heading south, all right, Jace. Must be going to his master. Beats me why he went all the way to Peach Place, though. He had to go someplace for help. A 
The only thought he gave to himself was just stopping long enough to be fed before he headed back here. How far do you reckon we'll have to go? Well, we came 14 miles by car before the dirt road petered out. He came a lot farther than that. Might have taken him a couple of days. Well, we'll have to stop him at night. If he keeps going that long and tie him off. We better make sure we can catch him before dark so he don't get away from us altogether. Uh, chances are he'll wait for us. After all, we're the help he came after. If he doesn't, we'll be able to follow him anyhow. In the dark? Yeah. I treated his collar with some phosphorus paint. Hey, whatever made you think of that? Uh, trick my father taught me a long time ago. He had an old hound dog, great hunter. Got a throat injury and couldn't sound off. Blowing collar made up for it. Well, like they say, we live and learn. <laughs> Hey, look. Look where the dog's cutting, up in the foothills. Yeah. That's Ambush Canyon that way, isn't it? Sure is. See, no wonder that dog's so beat up. I wouldn't tackle this country in an army tank if I didn't have to. I wonder if that blind fellow would be alive when we find him. I don't think so, Sheriff. If he was alive, I don't think the dog would ever have left him. Come on, Charlie. Ah. <laughs> What kept that dog going, I'll never know. We hit stretches where we had to lead the horses on foot. It was toward sundown of the second day when the dog caved in. He made a feeble attempt to inch along on his stomach and then just rolled over on his side, panting. He's done for, Jace. Can't even take water. I I better... No, Sheriff. Put your gun away. But, Jace, he couldn't move another inch if he wanted to. I'll carry him with me on charcoal. Man would be mighty lucky if he could find a human being that'd go this far for him. Uh, He'd never have led us this far back if you hadn't had the vet work on him. Well, what do we do now? Keep on going, I guess. If his master is in here, he must have left some trail. We'll keep cutting through till we find marks. Jace, how would a blind man get into this country and why? I don't know. But if he wasn't here, the dog wouldn't have been here either. We better move on till we find a good spot to make camp. These horses need some attention on the night of rest, too. Meantime, maybe I can do a little doctrine on the dog. Won't do any good, Jace. All you'll need is a pack shovel. He just stopped breathing. He's dead. The next morning, we started trail cutting, working steadily to the south, toward the international border, the Rio Grande. Well, the country's getting a mite better now, Jace, but we're only about a half a mile from the river. If anybody else had been in here recently, we'd have seen some sign of a trail. Nobody could come through here without leaving some kind of tracks. That dog didn't head this way for nothing, Sheriff. He must have... Hey, hold it a second. Huh? What is it? Look at this. Dog hair caught in this thorn brush. Yeah. Must have been a few days ago when the dog headed out. Look at the color. German Shepherd, all right. We're still in the right trail, then. But why no human tracks? Well, the dog came out of here on foot. But this may not be the way he and his master got in here originally. What other way is there? On the river, in a raft, or a flat-bottom boat? Well, how could a blind man navigate the river? He didn't have to be alone, Sheriff. That dog was beaten on the head, remember? It isn't likely his master did that, is it? No, I see what you mean, but how... Wait a minute. Look up ahead there, along the side of the ridge, about a quarter of a mile. Yeah, looks like part of the rock and the earth have been scooped out. Mm. Must have been a little landslide. Not on a rock facing as solid as that looks. What do you suppose it is, then? Let's find out. It took us more than an hour to reach the base of the ridge and find the answer. It wasn't a landslide. There were a couple of dynamite caps on the ground. The fresh earth had been blown out. Uh, Two men, all right, Jace. Signs of tracks held tight in this fresh earth. Dog tracks go right along with the one set. That was the blind man. Yeah, another mark running in with those tracks, though. Little round hole in the ground every few steps. Mm, blind man must have had a cane, too. Move around the wide circle and cut back to this spot until... Oh, wait, Jace. Hmm? Now, what's that thing over there by the brush? Long white piece or something. A white cane. Come on. A head of its stain, Jace. Looks like blood. Yeah, it is. The dog must have been clubbed with that. Uh, blood stains didn't come from the dog, Sheriff. Lump he had on his head didn't bleed. <laughs> Let's beat through this brush. Blood trail on the ground through here, Jason. Yeah. That path just ahead seems to be pressed down in one spot. Let's make for it. A man's body, all right. Face down. Better roll him over and see if it's a blind man. It's him, all right. 
You can tell by his right hand. Callous Ridge there from holding on to that dog harness. I took the white cane and the dynamite caps and rode along the shore of the river to the nearest town. Called Austin to fly a lab man down and arrange for a boat to pick up the sheriff and the body. I was in the local constable's office 24 hours later when the body was brought into town. Well, body's over at the undertaker, Jace. Good. Constable told me you were in here looking over a report from your lab man. Yeah. No lead on the dynamite caps, but we learned plenty from the cane. Two sets of prints, one unidentified. Must have been the blind man's. Now what about the other set? man who left the other set had a criminal record. Name was James Waterman. Got out of Huntsville six years ago. Waterman? Say, I, I remember that name. You ought to remember it. He pulled ten years for armed robbery. Forty thousand dollar payroll stick up back in 24. Money never was recovered. I wonder why he killed that blind man. And why was he blasting in the face of that rock ridge? Something we'll ask him when we get him. Oh, was the lab man at the funeral home when you brought the body in? Yeah, he's going over it now. Want to get some grub while you're waiting for him to finish? Yeah. He'll take prints off the body to compare with the ones he lifted from the cane. He'll have identification established by the time we get through. Good. Let's go. I'll be glad to eat something I haven't had to cook myself. Mm -hmm. You know, funny thing. We started off so fast after that dog turned up the other day, I never did check that missing persons bulletin for the blind man's name. His name was Joseph Wilson. Lived in a rooming house in Ozona. Operated a newsstand. Landlady reported him missing when she didn't see him or the dog for two days. There's a cafe across the street. We took our time. A statewide pickup was out for James Waterman, and it seemed just a matter of pinning him down. But when we got finished and walked over to the funeral home, the case wasn't so simple. Our lab man, Marty Ferris, was just finishing a phone conversation. No, I said there's no doubt about it. Yeah, check on it. Pearson just walked in. I'll tell him. Bye. Howdy, Jason. Howdy, Marty. Marty Ferris, Sheriff Fritchie. Sure, we met I... when the sheriff came in with the body. And, Jace, we got trouble. This thing is blown wide open. Why? Right, what's the matter? That's the print. And take a look at them. Now, here's a copy of the unidentified set I sent on to Austin. The man who made them has no record. Well, why should he have a record? Aren't they the blind man's prints? Uh, no, they aren't, Jace. The prints on the body match the known prints pulled from the cane. The dead man is James Waterman. What? <laughs> That's it, Sheriff. Here, look at the print. See for yourself. Marty, could you have made a mistake? No, Jace. I just checked with Austin on the phone by classification number. Waterman must have been blinded sometime after he left Huntsville. He took the name of Wilson as an alias. Uh, now all we've got is a set of unidentified prints that might match anybody in the state. Sheriff, our killer isn't going to be easy to find. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Blind Justice, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Whoever the blind man's companion had been, there had to be a starting point for their journey along the river, a place where they'd picked up a boat or a raft. The sheriff and I worked our way along the river above the town, questioning the occasional Mexicans who managed somehow to make a living where no living was to be made. And in one spot, less than a mile from the road, we found something. I can see it clearly now, Jace. Yeah. Impression of a flat bottom boat on that mud flat. Had to be dragged quite a ways to the water. Not many days ago either. Oh, oh boy. Mud around where the boat was is caked dry. Spot where the boat was setting still looks damp. Uh-huh. Boat must have been there without being used for quite some time. River's been way down for more than a year. A little smoke coming up from behind those trees. Must be a Mexican hut. Whoever's there might own the boat. Let's ask him. Get up, Charlie. Up, Come boy. Mmm, tacos cooking. Smell him? Yeah. Smell something else, too. Chicken frying. There's a place. I can see it now. Yeah, pretty high class for river hut. Looking back, chicken coop. Kind of new, too. Coop wire, I mean. Hasn't been up very long. Yeah, a woman out in front of the place. Well, she sees us. Buenos dias, senor. Oh, buenos dias, senora. Whoa, whoa, Chuck. Whoa, boy. Yeah. Maybe you can help us out, senora. We'd like some information about a boat that was out on that mud flat until a few days ago. I never see a boat there, senor. You never saw one there. 
Well, what made that impression in the mud, then? I... I called my husband. He speaks better English. Hmm. Daniel? Menga? Yes. What the matter? You don't let me sleep. Huh? They know something about that boat, all right, Jase. Yeah. My husband. He come. Hey, you want something, senor? They want to know... There's a mark left by a boat down in that mud flat. When was the boat there last? And what happened to it? Hey... It was maybe a week ago the boat disappeared in the night. One morning she's gone, that's all I know. Who took it? We don't know. Mm, just like that, huh? Si, si, just gone. Don't try to feed us a story like that, you... Now, just a second, Sheriff. Where do you work, Danielle? What do you do for a living? Well, uh, I do anything for whoever give me the work. But for a long time, nobody give me any. You must have saved a lot of money to be eating fried chicken and tacos. Where'd you get those chickens? I, I raised them, senor. Yeah, without hens and a rooster? There isn't anything in that coop old enough to sit a nest. And that coop wire is new. Well, what I mean to say, I, I was just starting to raise them. Where'd you get the money to buy that coop wire and the chicks? You better talk up. This is part of a murder investigation. Murder? Murder? Blind man was murdered downriver. He got there by boat. Oh, you... Senor, I, I got nothing to do with murder. I just sell the boat. Why didn't you say so before? Well, Bim, because the boat was not mine. But you sold it just the same. Say, say, look, I tell you the truth. The boat is there for two years, ever since we come here. I never know who owns it, and then one day the, the men come. The two men? Say, say. And one of them blind? Say, say. He got a dog and a white stick. The other man with him, he said to me, I give you $50 for the boat. Well, uh, I don't say that the boat is mine. I, I just let him give me $50. What the man look like? The one who could see? Oh, he's big, just like you. With the light hair, very wavy. Eyes uh, uh, blue. He said that when they come back, I can have the boat back for nada, uh, nothing. And he gave me more money if I don't tell nobody. I say, uh, you give me more now, huh? But he said he don't have no more until he come back. That's the whole truth, senor, just like Daniel tell you. All right. If it isn't the truth, we'll find out. Come on, Sheriff. Let's go. All right. Uh, you two stay right around here in case we want to see you again. Oh, we'll, we'll be here. We'll be here. We don't run away. Up, boy. Up, boy. Hey. Uh, heading back for the town? Yeah. Marty may have some more information. And I think we just got a lead from Danielle on why Waterman and the other man went down river. Well, if you did, you got something I missed. They promised Danielle more money when they came back. The money Waterman got in that stick-up 16 years ago never was recovered, remember? Oh, oh, I get it. That's why they dynamited into that rock ridge. Waterman must have hidden that money until it cooled off. That's right. But before he ever got back to it, he was caught and sent to Huntsville for 10 years. Why didn't he go for it as soon as he got out six years ago? That's one of the things we still don't know. Maybe Marty will have the answers when we get back to town. <laughs> Marty had the answers, all right. Reports from Austin that had come in while we were on the river. I made notes on everything, Chase, if you can read my writing. Oh, thanks. A check back shows that Waterman lost his sight three days after he left Huntsville six years ago. Now, it's hard to run down because he didn't have to report to anybody. He'd served his full term, no parole. I see. Happened in a highway accident, huh? Yeah, I caught a lift on a gasoline truck. Went over an embankment and caught fire. The driver was killed, Waterman blinded. Near Sonora. That means Waterman was headed this way from the pen. He was going straight for that money, Sheriff. But losing his sight stopped him. But why did it take him six years to move for it again? He had to find somebody to help him. A man with a load of stolen money hidden away doesn't trust many people. He finally trusted somebody. Mm, and got killed for it. I'm going to take a ride to Ozona. It's out of your county, Sheriff, but it's your case. You want to come along? You bet I want to come along. Let's go. <laughs> In Ozona, we went to the rooming house where Waterman had lived under the name of Joseph Wilson. The landlady showed us to his room. It hadn't been rented to anybody else, and his things were still there. A few books in Braille, clothing, an extra harness for the dog. Everything is just like he left it, just like it was when the police come after I called them. I haven't touched a thing. No money, nothing valuable was left here. Only what you see. It's all right, ma'am. Don't be upset. Nobody accused you of taking anything. But I just want you to know there wasn't nothing to take. He never had nothing. Always a couple of weeks behind in his rent. 
Not that I minded. I had nothing but sympathy for the poor man. Even fed his dog for him or never would have been fed. Look, something you just said is important to me. Now, if he owes you money, there's nobody to pay it, so you're, you're just going to lose it. The truth can't hurt you one way or the other. Did he really owe you rent money? Why, yes. Why else would I say it? Every once in a while, he'd catch up. he got some kind of benefit checks from someplace once in a while. Well, what's your angle there, Jay? I'm just figuring, Sheriff. Daniel got $50 for that boat he sold. There must have been more expenses getting from here down there. Somebody had to finance it. His traveling companion, whoever it was. Yeah. That's a cinch it was somebody Waterman met and got to know right here in Ozona. Ma'am, did Mr. Waterman, uh, Mr. Wilson have any visitors here? Any friends? No, I never saw a soul. There was some fellow called him a few times, though, when he was homesick and couldn't work at the newsstand. You know who it was? No, he never gave me his name. Mr. Wilson just said it was somebody he knew from the stand. The same fellow each time? As far as I could tell from the voice. I see. Thanks. Come on, Sheriff. Was that all you want here? Yeah, thanks. We located the place where Waterman had had his newsstand, a main intersection near a bank, a restaurant, an office building, and a medical and professional building. Somebody else was running the stand now. We staked out in my car across the street. Looking for somebody fitting the description Danielle gave us? That's right. Man who called whenever Waterman was sick might have been a regular customer. There could be quite a few customers fitting that description, Jay. we will tag the ones who come close. See if the newsie or anybody around has any information on him. Somebody might have noticed the man we're looking for hanging around the stand from time to time. If he knew Waterman well enough to call his rooming house, he knew him well enough to stop for a talk. You're right, of course, but this kind of waiting wears me out. It's the dullest part of the job, Sheriff, but sometimes it's the part that pays off. For two days, we watched the corner. Occasionally, we followed a man who fitted the description supplied by Danielle, but each time we checked, the subject turned out to be somebody who hadn't been out of town. Then, just before the end of our second day of watching, I nudged the sheriff. What is it, Jase? Over there. No, past the newsstand. Just going into the medical and professional building. Oh, yeah. He looks like he might be the boy, all right. His hair is really light and curly, which most of the others haven't been. Let's see where he went. Oh, oh, wait a minute. He's still in the lobby. There by the elevator. Let's wait until he's picked up. There's the elevator now. Well, there it goes. He's the only passenger. Come on. Watch the floor marker. See where the elevator stops. Third floor, Jase. Yeah, let's take a look at the building directory on the wall. Third floor, two doctors, a dentist, an attorney, and a chiropodist. Go up to that floor. Try them all. You want me to grab him? No. If you spot him in a waiting room, just sit down like you're waiting too. After he leaves, find out anything you can about him. I'll wait back in the car and tag him after he comes out. How do we get together again? After I find out where he lives, I'll come back and pick you up on the corner. I waited for the man with the light curly hair. He came out of the building in 20 minutes. I started my car away from the curb slowly, keeping him in sight. He turned the corner and got into a car of his own, drove to an apartment building. I noted the address and then went back and met the sheriff. I hope you didn't lose him, Jace. I think he's the one we want. Why? What'd you get? He was in to see a doctor. Had a dressing on his arm changed. Doc said he's a regular patient who's been away on vacation. Mm, been out of town, huh? Yeah, but that isn't all. It's what he's being treated for that ought to make you sit up. Dog bite. Dog bite? <laughs> I thought that shepherd might have gotten to the killer just once before he was knocked out. Let's go visit him. I know the apartment building he lives in. You get his name from the doc? J.B. Rowland works on the local newspaper. Reporter? No, has charge of distribution and circulation. Also takes care of the morgue. Uh, back issue files. Oh, that'd put him in touch with Waterman on the circulation end. And his taking care of the back issues might fit, too. That might have told him who Waterman really was. Hey, that's right. Fishing through some old back issues, he might have read about the robbery and Waterman's conviction. Maybe seen a picture of Waterman and recognized it. That'd make him get friendly. He'd know the money was never recovered and that Waterman didn't have it on hand or he wouldn't be running a newsstand and living like he did. You think he told Waterman what he knew and finally talked him into a deal? Or do you think maybe he forced him into it? When we see him, we'll ask him. Uh, 
There's the door, Jace. Apartment 2B. Gonna knock? Yeah. Yeah? Who is it? Special delivery. Well, I'm not dressed. You better slip it under the door. You got a sign for it. Oh? Okay. Hope you got a pencil. All right, Roland. Open it all the way. I'll open it. I'll open your skull. Watch him, Jay. Stay away from that desk. You're not taking me. Give me that gun. Oh, my my, my arm. Yeah. Same arm Waterman's dog chewed on, huh? I I don't know what you're talking about. No? Just the same you went right for a gun. Brand new gun at that. Like you were expecting you might have trouble. Come on, get up. Why'd you kill him? You want all the money instead of a split? Money. (laughs) <laughs> money. Yeah, where's the money? What'd you do with it? What did I do with it? I worked on him for months until he trusted me. Then we went down to the river, but we couldn't find the place. Couldn't remember all the landmarks. Couldn't see, and after 16 years, he couldn't remember. He couldn't remember. I went crazy. I planned on it so much, I went crazy. That's so all. If I had the money, I, I could have gotten away. Without the money, I had to come back here so they wouldn't be looking for me. All right, Roland. Go get some clothes on. <laughs> Looks like that 40000 is really gone for keeps, Chase. Yeah. Buried in a rock ridge somewhere near the Rio Grande. That's money that never bought anybody anything. I feel sorry for that dog, Chase, breaking his heart and dying like he did. Funny thing about a dog, a dog never passes judgment. He just sticks right to the finish, whether you're good or bad, worth it or not. I'll help Roland get a jacket on, then we can take him in. For the murder of James Waterman, alias Joseph Wilson, J.B. Roland was convicted and sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for a period of 99 years. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Peggy Weber, Herb Feigren, Ed Begley, Earl Keane, Tom Holland, and Tom McKee. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow night, NBC will present Parallel 38, the dramatization of the work of the Red Cross during the current crisis with Raymond Massey in the starring role. Brigadier General David Sarnoff will explain the needs of the Red Cross during the 1951 fund campaign. So listen tomorrow to Parallel 38 and let your heart guide your hand when you give to the Red Cross. The Telephone Hour welcomes UC Beerling tomorrow on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death by adoption. (laughs) 
It is 9.45 p.m. on a Saturday night, September 1937. The business district of Central City, Texas is dark, except for the office of Harry Cashman's used car lot. Cashman is pacing the small office in agitation. A man in a leather windbreaker crosses the lot, slipping between the cars for sale and knocks at the door. Well, how do you, Mr. Cashman? Uh, Glad to see you waited for me. All right, spit it out. What do you want this time? I'm kind of short on folding money. Thought you might be a pal and help me out again. You know what this is, don't you, Stryker? The Lord called it a shakedown. I gave you $100 two weeks ago and another $100 the month before. So I need more. Well, you're not getting more, not from me. Why, it's too bad. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Cashman. I kind of thought you were a nice guy. Uh, kind of guy I'd like to see raise my baby. As long as I can't raise her myself. Now, you leave the baby out of this. Now, you can't expect me to forget about her, Mr. Cashman. After all, she's my own flesh and blood. She belongs to me and my wife, legally, by adoption. Yeah, but you keep forgetting one important thing. I never signed no papers letting you adopt her. Your wife said you were dead. She thought I was dead. But my being here proves I ain't. And if we ever have to take this into court, Mr. Cashman, I'm baby Ann's natural father. I got my rights, you know. All right, how much? Reckon a hundred will see me through again. I'll give you five hundred. Why, it's better. Now, just a minute. I'll give you five hundred if you sign a paper waiving all rights to baby Ann. I ain't signing nothing. I like our arrangement just the way it is. It's working out fine. If you think... Well, go ahead, Mr. Cashman. Answer. It may be business, and I'd like to see you do a good business. For the baby's sake, you understand? <sighs> Hello. Harry, why aren't you home? It's almost 10 o'clock. Oh, I'll be home in a little while, Hazel. Uh, something came up. You sound worried. Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. Of course not. The baby wanted to wait up for you. I let her stay up till 8.30, but by then she just kept rubbing her eyes and her nose and saying, where's my daddy, till she couldn't hold her little head up. Well, I, I'm sorry, Hazel. Uh, give her a kiss for me. I, I'll be home in a little while. Harry, are you sure there's nothing wrong? You sound like you're upset about something. Oh, it's, it's nothing. I'm just tired. I'll see you in half an hour. Well, all right, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye, honey. That your wife? Yes. Never did meet her. Maybe we ought to all get together, have a little talk, huh? Stryker, if you try that, it's the last talk you'll ever have. What are you trying to do? Your baby's got a home, a good home, and we love her. We've been married 15 years, never had a child of our own. And now we've got her, and she's ours. Why, if we ever lost her, we'd have nothing to live for. Haven't you got a heart? Well... I can see I made a big mistake, Mr. Cashman. I should have started seeing you a lot sooner and a lot oftener. Now, what do you mean by that? That from now on, I'll be around every Saturday night to pick up my hundred dollars. And I'll take tonight's payment right now. Why, don't you... be a fool, Mr. Cashman. I'm younger and a lot stronger than you. Now, don't get yourself hurt. Now, how about my money? All right, Stryker. There's your hundred. And it's the last you're getting. Now, get out of my sight and don't ever come back. Because if you do, I'll go to the police. I'll spend every dollar I've got fighting you. I'll prove what you are. I'll prove you're not fit to have custody of Anne. Mr. Cashman, I do believe you mean that. Eh? I swear before heaven I mean it. So this is your parting gift to me, eh? Not much considering the size of the role you peeled it off, huh? All right. All right, I'll leave you alone. I'll take my payment in full right now. Dig that roll out again. Toss on the desk. Oh, I see. Now it's a gun, huh? You see it, and I know how to use it. How could Anne have a father like you? She couldn't have, not you. You've never proved you are her father. <laughs> You're getting real bright tonight, Mr. Cashman. I get the money up on the desk. I'm not going to give you another dime, Stryker. All I'm going to give you is what you deserve. Get away from that phone. I'm going to call the police. You ain't calling any police. Maybe I'm stronger than you think. Haven't you ain't stronger than Oh, now, give me that money. Maybe you should have been fighting your way. You see, you're still the only one who knows about me, and you ain't never going to tell anyone else. Thanks for the final payment. At 11 o'clock, after three more calls to her husband's used car lot, 
Hazel Cashman was disturbed by the busy signal and her husband's failure to come home. A phone company check showed the line was not in use. Hazel Cashman called the police. They found Harry Cashman's body and requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He arrived at the lot shortly after 2 a.m. Now, Fred, that's all the information I can give you, men. Oh, uh, howdy, Ranger. You must be Jace Pearson. That's right. You in charge here? Yeah. Uh, Dan Simmons, chief of police. Uh, fellas, I'll talk to you later. All right. Okay. I see you've already lifted some fingerprints. Huh? How'd you know? Oh, dusting powder on the glass top here. Uh, yeah, the crew just left. Ah, uh, prints aren't going to be much good, though, I'm afraid. Too many people coming in and out of a place like this, signing papers on that desk. What's that over there, Chief? What? Oh, that the yellow spot on the carpet? Yeah. I noticed that before. Seems to be a piece of chalk that was stepped on. A few little pieces not quite ground in. I don't see a blackboard or anything around here. Any of the for sale signs on the cars marked with chalk? No, no. They're all marked with cardboard cutouts. Well, the floor is pretty clean otherwise. Waste paper basket's empty. Yeah. This place was swept out after the day's business. That chalk got ground into the rug last night after the place was cleaned. Yeah, I can see that now. And the phone hanging off the hook like that when you got here? Uh-huh. Cashman struggled with whoever killed him. Must have been trying to make a call. Oh, I don't know, Jace. Body's just where we found it. Good eight feet from the phone. Yeah, he might have staggered over there and fell, but the fight started right here by the desk and the phone. Uh, got some reason for being so sure of that? The desk was moved a little in the fight, Chief. Look at the carpet. Deep worn spot where the desk usually rested. Carpets bunched up around the base, showing the desk was pushed, not lifted and moved for any reason. Uh, you're right. I can't see that it helps us any, though. Gives us a little picture of the action, that's all. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get some of this yellow chalk in an envelope. Uh, you're going to send that to your lab at Austin? That's right. They can analyze it. Maybe come up with something. That's worth a shot. Doesn't seem to be much anything else to help us, though. Robbery motive for murder is usually the toughest one to crack. Did Cashman make a habit of carrying a lot of money? Yeah, had to in this business. People selling cars in a hurry need a fast dollar. He usually had a couple of thousand on them. All we found in his pocket was 86 cents and change. Uh, you finished here? Yeah. I'd like you to put a man to work on that filing cabinet. Get a record of all sales. We've already checked that. Every car Cashman has accounted for. Nothing's been stolen from the lot. I wasn't thinking of a stolen car. I just want a list of recent customers. Oh. Somebody might have bought an automobile he wasn't happy with and come back to get even. Uh, it could be, but I'm afraid that's a blind alley too, Ranger. Cashman gave a mighty good guarantee on everything he sold, and he stood behind it a hundred percent. Just the same, let's check it. I want to examine every reason he might have been killed a hundred percent. I sent the ground yellow chalk through to Austin. There was nothing that could be done that night, but the next morning, Chief Simmons and I went to see Hazel Cashman, the dead man's wife. <laughs> we don't like to ask you questions at a time like this, Mrs. Cashman, but... I... I understand, and I want to help you if I can. Probably isn't much you can tell us, but any little thing might help. Your husband ever have trouble with anybody? No. Aside from the money he carried, do you know of any reason why anybody might have been out to get him? No, there was never anybody who didn't like Harry. What am I going to tell the baby? How am I ever going to make her understand that her daddy won't ever come home again? Would, Would you answer that for me, please? I... I don't want to talk to anybody now. Why, sure, ma'am. Maybe for us, anyhow. Had to leave this number at headquarters. Hello? Yes, yeah, Simmons speaking. Go ahead, I'll write it down. We, we were going on a picnic today. Last night, I made the sandwiches and everything. We, we were going to leave right after church. I knew something was wrong when he didn't come home. I knew it. Take it easy, ma'am. All week long, Harriet was teaching Ann how to say picnic. She was just learning to pronounce it. No. You've got to get a grip, ma'am, for your baby's sake. Yes. Yes, I know. All right. Thanks. We'll be in soon. I better get back to headquarters, Chase. Uh, unless you have something else to ask Mrs. Cashman. No. You shouldn't be alone, though, ma'am, especially when your baby wakes up. I called a neighbor just before you came. She'll be here in a few minutes. That's good. Goodbye, ma'am, and thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Cashman. 
Goodbye. Find out who killed my husband. He never hurt anybody. Never. We'll do our best, ma'am. That's the rush back to headquarters, Simmons. One of my boys pulled in a suspect, Jason. Oh? Fellow who worked for Cashman, a cleaning man named Moe Smith. What do they got on him? Well, he cleaned the office last night at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Cashman usually closed before then on Saturday nights, but Smith admits Cashman was still there when he cleaned up. Well, he's not trying to hide anything there. No, no, but there's something else. Moe Smith was on the town last night, threw a big party and threw a lot of money around. Still had a few hundred on him when he was picked up. And uh, my man checked on that, Jace. Smith is usually dirt poor. I see. He's going to be worth talking to. You can say that again. I'd have told you inside the house, but I didn't want to say anything in front of Mrs. Cashman. That was best. How old is their baby? Mm, just two years old, Jace. Why? You look kind of funny. How old are the Cashmans? Well, I'd say Harry was about 55. Guess Mrs. Cashman must be in her 40s. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, the baby's an adopted child. I thought they were a little bit old to have a child of that age. Yeah, they never had any of their own. A couple of years ago, they took in a poor girl who'd lost her husband. Anne was her child. Cashman's took to the kid right off. Then the mother got sick, and when she knew she was dying, she agreed to let the Cashman's adopt the baby. No kid ever got a better break, believe me. I gathered they were pretty crazy about her. Plenty crazy. Why, if that kid even sneezed, Harry Cashman would be ready to charter a plane and fly at a Mayo Clinic. They wrapped their lives around her, just like she was their own. When you feel that way about a kid, it is your own. Loving them is what makes them belong to you. Yeah, you can say that again. Say, any messages from my headquarters in that phone call you took? Oh, Jace, I forgot. I, I was too hot about my man picking up Moe Smith. Your lab phoned in a report on that chalk. Any lead? Well, I, I don't know under the circumstances, but it wasn't an ordinary piece of chalk. Analysis showed that it's a special type that surveyors use for marking. Surveyors, huh? Yeah. Isn't likely that a janitor would be carrying the kind of chalk used by surveyors. Oh, it might have come from any place, Jace. A customer might have dropped it. It was dropped and stepped on after the office had been cleaned. Maybe our case against Moe Smith isn't going to be as strong as it looks. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death by Adoption, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. At the city jail, Moe Smith was being held in an ante room. The day was cool, but beads of sweat stood out on his forehead. If he was innocent, he didn't look it. I began to forget about the surveyor's chalk. Come on, Mose. Where were you last night? I was at a party, Mr. Simmons, at my own house. And where were you before the party? I was working for Mr. Harry Cashman at the used car lot. Everybody knows I work there. What time did the party start, Mose? Uh, after 10 o'clock, sir. And later we left my house and went a few other places. With you paying all the bills? Well, well is that right or isn't it? That's right, sir. I don't remember much about it. Next thing I knew it was this morning and a policeman woke me up and brought me down here. What time was it when you left the car lot last night? Oh, I worked almost nine o'clock, sir. Cleaning up like I always do. Was Mr. Cashman all right when you left the lot? No, sir, he wasn't. Mr. Harry was always mighty nice to me. But somebody called him on the telephone. He didn't say much to whoever it was. Then he slammed the phone down real mad and he hollered at me to hurry up and finish. He never done that before, sir. Then when I got done and was ready to leave, he told me he's sorry he yelled at me like that. What'd you do then? I, I, I did some shopping for the party. Got some food, a couple of jugs of Sweet Lucy. Where'd you get the money? Spill it, Mose. Cashman was robbed and you had almost $300 on you this morning when you were picked up. It was my own money, sir, honest. You never got that kind of money working on a used car lot. Three days ago, you were broke. You borrowed $2 from your landlady. You better count for that money, Mose. Where'd you get it? Oh, well... From the numbers. Numbers? You mean you've been gambling on the numbers racket? Yes, sir. And yesterday my number hit. 424. I got my $500. That, that's how come I got money. You expect us to swallow that? Who paid you off, Mose? I don't know, sir. I don't know who he was. Are you trying to tell us you gambled on numbers without knowing who you gave your bets to? Please, sir. If I tell you who it is, Mr. Simmons is going to arrest him. And everybody will know I told. And if I don't find out, you're going to stand trial for murder. Everybody will know that, too. Oh, no, sir. Please. I never hurt Mr. Harry. 
Oh, I got the money from Jonas. One of the pin boys at the bowling alley. Jonas been booking numbers on the side? No, sir. He just worked for somebody for a little cut. All right, Mose. We'll check on your story. And it better be true. I told the truth every word. Well, he sounded on the level, Jace. And if he is, I'll be able to smash a hole in the numbers racket. Yeah, you can do that, all right. But we'll still be shy of murderer. <laughs> Simmons staked out the bowling alley where Jonas worked as a pin setter. Moe Smith had told the truth, all right. The pin boy confirmed it when he was arrested for possession of slips made out by betters playing the numbers. We were back to a single clue again, the yellow chalk. We've checked the only surveying crew in the city, Jace. Every man working on it had an alibi. All surveyors aren't in the city. That killer could have come from any place in the county. No road building projects underway and... Only other survey and crew we've been able to trace is the mapping crew down in the Big Bend. Not going to be easy to get to. I'll get to them. Wherever this car won't take me, the horse and the trailer I'm towing will. Huh? You leaving right away? As soon as I can drop you at your headquarters. I drove to the Big Bend to where the roads ran out, and I had to cut cross country to reach the mapping crew. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer. The crew was deep in wild country. Almost a full day's ride before I reached him. All right, Chucky. Easy, boy, easy. Anybody here? Hello, over this way. Come on, Chucky. Well, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Saw marks of a camp here, but it looked deserted. It is. We moved in another couple of miles. I just come back with the birds to haul the last of our stuff onto the new camp. I was just tying a pack on this last one. You the crew foreman? Yeah. I'll ride on away with you. Keep you from getting lonesome. Glad to have you. I got company, though. One of my men just went on ahead a few minutes ago. We'll catch up to him on the way. Hey, you want me to take one of those lead ropes? No, they're good burrs. They won't give me no trouble. All right, let's go. Up, Chuck. Up, boy. Come on, you long-eared scavengers. You've had enough grazing. You must be covering a lot of ground in here. Oh, plenty. Now, sprawling country like this... Ranchers lose sight of their boundaries when the land ain't fenced off. Hey, you, uh, after somebody in here, Ranger? Maybe. How long you fellas been working through here? Oh, been almost two months now. You ever pull out to go into town? Well, we got horses, of course, but it's a long ride to a road and transportation any place of any size. <laughs> I just decided to grow me some whiskers and stay here till the job's done. Any of your men ride out? Oh, yeah. A few of them go out weekends to Central City or someplace like that for Saturday night. Then they got to turn around and spend all day Sunday coming back. Family men usually stay and just keep on working, pile up overtime. How many men you got working? Oh, I got 11. Any of them away last weekend? Yeah, four of them. You know where they went? No. Hey, I reckon Bill Stryker can tell you, though. Who's he? There's a fellow with other burrows. Ah, oh, there he is, just topping that rise, about a quarter of a mile ahead. He one of the ones who left camp? Yeah, they all went off together. Let's catch up to him. Okay, come on, boy. Get a bird. Get up, Charcoal. We rode after the man named Bill Stryker. On the way, I saw the surveyor's marks I'd been following for miles. Cloth markers nailed to trees. Yellow chalk marks on rocks. Within a few minutes, we caught up to him. Well, yeah, Ranger... We was away for the weekend, like Tracy told you. Me and three other fellas. Where'd you go? Central City. Only place worth going we'd get to in time. What did you do up there? Well, just fool around. All of us together. Well, you were only there for Saturday night. You must have done something special, something you remember. I saw one of the boys mentioned a dance, Striker. Well, well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. A uh, squad dancer, Alamo Ballroom. You spend the whole evening there? Yeah. Like I said, we were all together. All evening. Four stags at a dance drift around. Hard to keep an eye on each other all evening. E, yeah, I reckon we could lose sight of each other for a minute or two. You fellas take time out to do any shopping? Well, what could we buy that we could bring back here? I thought maybe one of you might be saving some money, maybe enough to make a deal on a used car. Uh, we, we rode a bus both ways after our horses got us from here to Lannis Junction. Oh, that's too bad. If you'd been shopping around a used car lot, you might have been able to help me. You might have gotten a look at a man who killed a dealer named Cashman in Central City on Saturday night. Killed? Hey, Ranger, you got a reason for being here. 
Hey, you think one of my crew killed that man? I'll know better when we see the other three who went to town with Stryker here. Let's get on to the camp. <laughs> It didn't help. They all told the same story. There were gaps, times during the evening when they drifted away from each other, but they couldn't pin it down to any specific time on the clock. I didn't have anything to take them in on singly or together. They knew it, and I knew it. I camped with them overnight and headed back to Central City Police Headquarters. Oh, how'd you case? How'd you make out? No good, Chief. Yeah, we haven't turned up anything new either. Just a chance armed robbery, Jace. That's what it must have been. My feelings still buck at that, Simmons. Mose told us that Cashman was upset about a phone call. Stayed at the lot long after he should have gone home. There must have been a reason. Like what? Like somebody who wanted to see him, telling him to wait there. Yeah. Mose said the call made Cashman mad. Why'd he wait for somebody he was mad at? Maybe because they had some kind of a club they could use to make him wait, whether he liked it or not. You're still digging for something deeper than an armed robbery motive, then. That's right. Well... Nobody's given us anything to back up any other motive. I know, but a man doesn't make a telephone appointment to be robbed and murdered. He makes it for something else. I'm going out to see Mrs. Cashman again. When you called your husband last Saturday night, it was almost ten, you said. What makes you think he was upset? When you're married to a man for 15 years, you just know that's all. But he said there was nothing wrong. Anything like that ever happened before? His not coming home, I mean, acting upset? Yes, it did. Twice before. Once was almost two months ago, then a couple of weeks ago. Those other times. You remember what day they happened on? I mean, can you remember if it was always on a Saturday? Yes. Always, all three times. But I don't know why. I don't know what was bothering him. How did he react? He was nervous, irritable. It surprised me the first time. Harry had never been that way with anybody. He snapped at me, the hired girl, apologized later, but the only one he didn't snap at was the baby. He just seemed to want to hold her in his lap, just sit there and rock back and forth, holding her. And then during the night, he kept getting up, going to a crib to look at her. I see. Ma'am, did your husband ever say he was worried about somebody trying to take little Anne away from you? Why, no. Who could take her from us? Both her parents were dead. Her mother agreed to the adoption before she passed on. You ever know the baby's father? Ever see him? No, he died before Anne was born. Killed in an accident. You're sure of that? Well, that's what Anne's mother told her. She couldn't have lied. Have you got a copy of the baby's birth certificate? Yes, right in this drawer. With a copy of the adoption papers we got from the court. Here's the court order. And the papers signed by Anne's mother, Dorothy Stryker. Stryker? Was the father's name Bill or William Stryker? Why... No. Here it is on the birth certificate. His name was Arthur Stryker. Came from Fort Worth. Ranger, what is it? I think I know who killed your husband now. And I'm beginning to figure why. You'll hear from me, ma'am. I headed for the Big Bend, making a radio check with KTXA, asking the station to contact the Fort Worth police on possible relationship between Arthur and William Stryker. The answer fit. They'd been brothers. But William Stryker had a criminal record. It was late afternoon when I mounted charcoal for the ride into the surveying camp. I reached it at about 3 a.m., dismounted, and slipped into the office tent. Tracy. What the... Shh, quiet. It's me, Pearson. Oh, you scared me. Shh. Oh. Why'd you come back? Not all your boys were square dancing at Central City. Where's Stryker sleeping? Oh, Stryker, huh? That's right. I'm back. Near where the horses are hobbled. We well, better be careful, Ranger. He's got a gun. Good. A test can give me the final proof I need if it's the same gun that killed Cashman. Well, I'll come with you. If he wakes up before I get to him, you hit the ground and stay there, no matter what happens. Don't worry. I'm a surveyor, not a hero. There, under that tree. Branches in the moon got it all in shadow, though. He's not here. Somebody's trying to get away with one of the horses. Come on. Oh, he must have seen you out in the moonlight crossing to the tent. Get away from that horse, Striker. You're in the light now. I can see you, too. It's something you won't see. Oh, Ranger, you're hit. Drop. <laughs> Got him. Be careful. Might be a trick. Are you other men? Stay down. Don't move. 
Oh, it's no trick, Ranger. Oh, he's hit more than once and bad. Uh, I don't want to die. Don't let me die. Better get whatever first aid stuff you have. It. Try and patch him up. You're going to need some work, too. I'll be all right. You men can get up now. Need a couple of you to make a letter. I need it to take him in. I... Easy, Ranger. I got you. Oh, men will have to make two litters. You need one yourself. William Stryker lived long enough to confess his masquerade as the father of his dead brother's child and the murder of Harry Cashman. He was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at the nearest emergency hospital. Jace Pearson had three bullets removed from his body. They matched the bullet taken from the body of Harry Cashman. Six weeks later, Jace Pearson reported back to his company, ready again for duty with the Texas Rangers. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. There's a story about one of the first Texas Ranger captains whose outward appearances seemed to be little more than a boy. One of the Rangers in his command, a big, raw-boned, muscular fellow noted for his complete lack of fear, was asked by a townsman, how come a big fellow like you takes orders from him? Why, he ain't even got enough of a beard to need shaving. The Ranger looked at the townsman. Maybe he hasn't got much of a beard, the Ranger admitted. But when we go out after a gang of bandits with them outnumbering us three or four to one, I never yet heard the captain say, go get them, boys. He always says, come on, men, follow me. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Joe Kearns, Tom McKee, Roy Glenn, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Coming up next on NBC, it's genial accordion-playing master of ceremonies, Phil Baker, back at his old Sunday night stand asking America's favorite question. What's that? Why, the $64 question, of course. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to all the fun and prizes and excitement of everybody's favorite quiz game, the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the Railroad Hour. Right now, it's the $64 question on NBC. So what did you guys think? Did you enjoy it as much as I did? Fun fact here, Joe McRae was actually offered the lead role in Rawhide, but decided not to do it. I love Rawhide as it is, but it's interesting to think what it would have been like with Joe McRae. Well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, why not leave a like or comment down below, tell me what you thought about it. And remember, I'm not one of these YouTubers that's always gonna constantly ask you to subscribe to the channel, because if you wanna subscribe, I know that you'll click the red subscribe button down below and do that all on your own without any prompting from me. Don't forget to check out our affiliate links down below. If you're feeling generous, why not buy us a coffee? As always, your support helps me to keep providing this great free content for you. So thanks again for joining us for this great crime drama, Tales of the Texas Rangers. And as always, thanks for tuning in.